it was I, just we had an anti tank gun. Okay. I was an anti tank gun. Uh huh. And we told the gunner all the time. I'll tell you a f story ahead of the time. We were going down this road. I said, go and support somebody. Mm -hmm. The airborne was assigned unattached. We were never attached to the 7th Army or anybody. So we're going down this road and the sign says to turn right. So we get down the road and I start to get the jitters mm -hmm. and the Sergeant McGinnis is up, all everything. And I look, I could see mile and a half as clear as day. Right. There was something down the road going on. So he stops and they pull everybody on the side, you know, cut everything off and get out. So they look, they down, nobody sees anything except me. But that's enough to give warning. All right. So he says, we better go back then. So all of a sudden they could hear something going on. Mm -hmm. So then it takes a lot to back the Jeep up when you got something on it. Right. Well, you know. Oh, yeah, low power. So I said, let's unhook the Jeep, mm -hmm. the gun, and you can back the Jeep up and we'll hook the gun up. Captain says, there goes Barry again. He's always got something. He said, unhook the gun. So we backed out of there and we got a sure enough and just when we got out. Well, just artillery? Yeah, wow. we, we would have gone right into there, yeah. trapped down the road. But what happened, the road ended because there was a, a little creek that went by there and right. they never finished the road. Wow. Where was that? Was that in Germany? Yeah. That, okay. Yeah, that was, we just, we just got in Germany. What, do you remember what town? Oh, don't remember. Approximately, yeah. But what they did is they, they turned the sign mm -hmm. from, from there to ah, here. To divert you? Oh. They did that in, they did that in Normandy too, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Wow. Uh, cool story. Um, so first off, what's your full name, sir? Russell J. Barry. <laughs> All right. And when, when were you born? May 7th, 1926. That would make you 95 currently, right? Okay. Uh, what was your full rank uh, when you left the service? And... I was a buck sergeant. Okay. And then what part of the armed services were you in? Hunt First Airborne Division. All right. Oh, 82nd. But I was... Attached to 101st? I... I, I got my discharge and everything, 101st. I spent about three or four months or more down in uh, Fort, uh, I can't remember, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Okay. But most was with the 101st. Okay. And then uh, when you, I guess when, when you were in, say, Germany, for example, do you recall what uh, squad, platoon, company, everything you were in? Was I what? Do you recall what exact unit you were in in terms of squad, platoon, company? I was company? in the 327 Glider Infantry. I was in Regimental Headquarters Company. Okay. That was an experience. Do you recall what squad you were in? <clears throat> no. No. Okay. Um, what was your role in that unit? What? what? Your role? In, My role? Yeah, in Regimental head well, Headquarters. I was an infantry and an anti-tank gunner. Okay. Um, I kind of want to back up a little bit. Can you talk about your early childhood, such as where did you grow up? Uh, what do you remember about your town or city? What were your most uh, memorable characters growing up? Well, I was born in New York City in the Bronx. When I was three years old, my sister was five, my brother was seven. We were on the corner of Ogden Avenue to meet my father coming home from work. He was a conductor in a bus company and, and timekeeper. And he gets off the trolley car and walks across the street, come, and a drunk driver comes along and hits him, flies up in the air and lands at our feet. Mm -hmm. All three of the kids. And he died right on the spot. So my mother had three kids and nobody to help him all her life. We didn't have a penny to our name most of the time. Mm -hmm. We then she got a widow's pension, and that's how we grew up. Okay. But she said, "Go on, I can." Wow. So we fought our way through life. Very cool. What were some of your fond memories of your childhood? My what? Your fond fond memories of your childhood. 
I'm in uh, public school 11. I was a monitor. And they bring this girl into school. Her family moved. I didn't know. Her. And they tell her, they tell Joyce to sit in front of that boy. Mm -hmm. That was me. Okay. And I told her, if you move an inch, I'll put your hat in the, <laughs> in the ink well. I was the ink monitor. <laughs> we changed inks then. Right. I don't know if you know that. I didn't, but... We had yeah. an ink well. Mm -hmm. You had a little ink thing in there, and they put the ink in, and they give you a pen to write with. Then I had to go and empty them all out, and I had to wash them to put the red ink in. I did that. PS11 was a beautiful school. They took care of us. When they had a free lunch program, and I got on it, and they had a bunch of Scottish women that worked in the in the, in the cooking area, and they were all short. So I used to go in and get stuff, I was tall, I used to get stuff off the shelves for them. Mm -hmm. So I ate last because of the free lunch. Okay. So when I got soup, mine came from the bottom. So I had all the vegetables in Yeah, you got the good stuff. All the meat and all the good <laughs> stuff and everything. Yeah. Cool. So then mommy and I made arrangements whenever we could do something where I'd with like everybody holding hands, I'd get in there. Went and I played in the neighborhood and everything. So we were friendly all the time through school. Uh, then we got to high school and in the, the senior year, I knew I was going to be drafted, so I dropped out of school. And we were still dating. So one Friday night I had this big date with her, a week from Friday. And uh, Uncle Sam comes and knocks on my door, says, you're in the army now, and they took me. We didn't have a telephone in our house. Matter of fact, I'll tell you that, we had a candy store that had four telephone booths. When somebody got a call, we were in the house and rang the bell three times and they down and answered the phone. Mm. Well, I couldn't get to a phone. So she's sitting there all dressed up, changed the hair and everything. I go in the army. Wow. So they take me down to Grand Central Station. They wouldn't let us move away. I had to sit in these seats. From there, I went to Fort uh, went to Fort Dix, New Jersey. Couldn't get a phone there. So I went overseas and I wrote them a couple of times. Never got an answer. Mm -hmm. So the war was over. I come home. I I had a start. I wrote to her. She wouldn't answer back. So I figured, well, she's pissed. Put it in English. <laughs> So I go to the, I get home, I get discharged, and uh, Friday I got discharged, yeah. Saturday it's pouring rain. So I get a cab, a car from across the street, Veterans Cab Company, they drive up the, and pick me up, take me to the movie. I'm sitting in there and this girl walks in and sits in front of me, and I look at her while it's Joyce. I said, Joyce, it's Russell. She says, my God, she says, I hate you, Russell Barry. Everybody in the movie is yelling, welcome home, Russell. How are you? Good to see you. This is Gloria. If Joyce don't want you, I'll take you. <laughs> so then uh, I went home from the movie, and I called the Jerome 75563. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't answer the phone. So after a week, I had a job with Esso. I went back to my job. So I couldn't call it during the day, I called to an answer it. So after about, uh, I'm going to say three weeks, her mother says, talk to him. So we went out, we walked that far apart. She wouldn't hold my hand, wouldn't do anything. And we mostly hung out in the ice cream parlor. Mm -hmm. At our age, I was only 22 then, 21, 22. <laughs> so then we started to go out a little bit. And we went dancing one night, and this guy's wife, she was a big, beautiful girl, and she danced so close, you couldn't put a card between us. She saw that, and she says, I better get close. And that was that. We that was <laughs> Very cool. So then we dated, and then one night, one afternoon, coming home from the Friday night, coming home from work, I could meet her, 
we could walk home. I don't you know, familiar with the Bronx at all? Not really, no. Well, there was, I could walk, and we're kissing on the street and everything, and the father's walking in the back of us. Hmm. He says, you had a wonderful time, didn't you? I said, yes, sir, <laughs> I'll see you later. <laughs> so she had to go up, and I went home. So that night, I was going to propose to her. So I had to ask her for a hand in marriage. Wow. So the mother I could kid with and not him. So I get up in the house and walk over and I says, Mr. Rickle, I'd like to have your daughter's hand in marriage. He says, okay. Peep the, her mother dropped her drink. <laughs> Everybody looked, he's kidding. <laughs> we became the greatest friends. Then we got married May 21st, 1946. Wow, that's a great story. It's like a movie. Married, how many years, Daddy? How many years were you married? Oh, we were married 71 and a half when she died. Wow. She decided, died December 4th, 2018. Okay. That's her daughter. Yeah. These two were like that. Yeah. <laughs> Who's, who does she look like? More like you or like her, you think? Oh, she's like a mother of All right. Yeah. She's a doll. All right. <laughs> the only one of her. Yeah. She know how to get along and does things. When she grew up, she helped people and she she started painting. She did some beautiful paintings. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Well, I took her to the painting place. So mommy and I did. And they didn't want her because she was too young. Mm -hmm. So he says, "Well, they says okay, we'll keep her for the day." They says, "Keep her in the back." Wow. And we had a good life together. Sounds like it. <laughs> I got a question for you. Uh, what was it like to grow up during the Great Depression? And Terrible. What do you remember from that time specifically? What, what stands out to you? Being hungry. Hungry? How many times uh, per day did you eat? Well, two or three. <laughs> but some people, we were so poor, and my mother, the rent we got from the... Uh, I forget what they call it now, but I don't remember. They, uh, they, the money we got was for the rent. We had enough mo money to eat half of the month or so. People used to use, leave milk bottles and, and cereal and stuff in front of us, in front of our door. Mm -hmm. Everybody helped. It was terrible. Everybody was sharing? The streets were full of furniture. Wow. People were dispossessed from the houses for not paying the rent. Mm. It was terrible. Wow. A lot of crime. What, uh, do you have any specific stories that you remember that really just stands out in, in your head from that era? Well, you told us about, you know, the ball games and getting into the movies. Oh, they going to the baseball games? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we used to go to the baseball games and <clears throat> some of the stuff I tell you may not be a hundred percent you got to give me a little leeway but it was 25 cents to get to the bleachers mm -hmm. we didn't have 25 cents we couldn't get it no matter what we did right so the policeman he gave them a penny or two and you could climb up these boxes go into the men's room and go and sit in the bleachers wow <laughs> that's good <laughs> that'll work <laughs> <laughs> that'll work work for them and work for us yeah Speaking of sports, uh, did you consider yourself more of the academic type or the athletic type? Yeah, in between both. Did you play any sports or anything? Yeah, I played, but I never played in school. Okay. What did you enjoy? Roller skating. I yeah. used to go roller skating in the rinks. Okay. I did dancing on skates and stuff like that. Okay. I liked, uh, I liked football. Right. I was, I was skating when I went to the army. I weighed 135 pounds, 130 pounds. Okay. You were on a basketball team? Yeah, I was on a church basketball team and I was terrible. <laughs> so in the final game of, uh, it was a church league, guy drops the ball right in front of me. Somebody knocked, I pick it up and they're telling me, pass, pass. I couldn't put the ball in the back. I get down, right up on this X spot on the gym, in the basket. Nice. I won the game. For them. Nice. Good feeling. <laughs> I see. You know, I played baseball, uh, local, everybody local and everything. Mm -hmm. I played shortstop for a while with a second baseman's glove. Okay. Later yeah. on, he was a really good tennis player, though, and he walked and did 
Huh? You walked for miles and miles every day. Oh yeah, we walked, mm-hmm. we walked every place. We walked across the <clears throat> bridge, across the Harlem River. They had trolley cars, and traffic to go to the movies. Right. Wow. Do you uh, do you remember your first few jobs as a teenager? First job. Yeah. First first job or two. I mopped the floors in a tailor shop. Okay. I delivered orders for the for the uh, grocery store, the, the vegetable store. I did anything I could do to make a make some money. Right. Sit at pins in the bowling alley. Oh yeah, I set up. Well, that was later. I set up pins in the bowling alley. Okay. Nineteen forty one. Wow. And we had to get a social security card, or we couldn't set the pins up. Wow. Okay. Do you, uh, kind of changing gears here, do you recall hearing about what was happening in Europe concerning the Nazi regime, or what were your thoughts, say, during the Battle of Britain? Do you recall hearing about uh, what was happening with Japan and the invasion of China? Yes. Uh, did it all make the mainstream news? I lived on Nelson Ave. I'm sorry, i got to tell you where. And uh, we had a, people across the street. I was pretty young then, probably 12, 30 years old. We used to play three steps to Germany. Okay. It was a game, somebody's it and had to catch you and you go and you play it. So these three guys came along and they told us that we knew them. You could play three steps to Czechoslovakia, Mm -hmm. Poland, Hungary, but not Germany. Right. So they were big enough that they stopped us. So my brother came along. He was number one in the Bronx where we lived. Nobody wanted to fight him. When he hits you, you bled. So he said we could play. So he joins in the game and they tell him he can't play. He goes over and he knocks the one guy right on his ass, right in the street, and they carried him up. So about three days later, uh, they went to a meeting and the mother was home alone. And she calls the grocery store and she had an order. She couldn't get it. So the guy in the grocery store delivers to, gets one of our guys to deliver the food to her, mm-hmm. he goes and he has to put him in a big Nazi flag up on the wall. Wow. So they come down and tell a local policeman, I got another one that I just remember doing, they told the local policeman about it and he went, he went up and he, he told the FBI about it and they came in and they said that left hand side where they live, nobody can go back up in there because there's gas. Okay. Gas. Right. <laughs> so they went up, they shut the gas off and everything, and they took pictures. So the next thing we know, there were hardly any cars in our neighborhood, nobody had any money. There was a car park there, and these two guys, they weren't just poverty stricken people. They said, play around the car, do what you want. That night they were gone. Mm-hmm. They moved the family out. Oh, wow. So was the. Uh was that family, were they just kind of national socialist sympathizers or were they actually no, from they Germany? Were, Nazis. were they actually from Germany? The mother and father, well, yo, mm. they were Nazis. Gotcha. All the way. Heil Hitler. Right. Wow. <laughs> um, so, kind of like those big wartime headlines before America was in the war, did they come up and you hear them on the news and everybody was talking about sure. them? And then when World War II started, they used to come out as there was a big headline and they'd come a big truck and they'd throw papers out and, and they say, extra, extra, read all about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, Germany invades France and, and then on and on like that. And then when uh, with Japan, we knew what was going on there. We knew what was going on in school, believe me. This was before Pearl Harbor even? Yeah, we, get, we were getting people from Czechoslovakia, Poland, Greece, all over the world. Just migrating. Migrating, yeah. going into school with us. Hmm. So uh, when Pearl Harbor happened, like, I guess, do you recall where you were and yes. how it made you feel? The whole thing. We were, I played a bugle in a bugle and drum corps, mm-hmm. PFC Mole Wolf Post. And we were out down by the Hudson River rehearsing for something. Peace, for peace thing going on. So we get back into the club and everybody's standing there and they're listening to the news. We caught the end of it that the Jap invaded Pearl Harbor. Mm-hmm. We didn't know where Pearl Harbor was. And everybody says, we're in the war. Right. 
It's interesting because you were 14, right? At that time? Oh, yeah. So when September 11th hit, I was 14. And I remember sitting in school watching the... The first I had heard about it, I was actually at the bus stop and I heard a, a train or a train, a, a plane ran into the towers and um, we got to school and in our first period we saw it on TV and then as we were watching it, then that's when the second plane hit. So I, I feel like I can empathize and understand kind of where y'all were coming from. All we had, all we had was the radio and the newspaper, then all the stuff was in the newspaper and they mm -hmm. told us what happened in Pearl Harbor and everything. My brother was in the first draft and he spent five or six years in the army. Okay. He was in Africa, Sicily, wow. all through the war, Normandy, all over. Wow. What what you, uh, division was he in? He was in the first uh, army division. Okay. Big red one? <laughs> huh? big, big red one? Big red one, yeah. All right. And I think, I never was able to I think he had two silver stars. Okay. Now that brings a later story up. I'm in the army and I'm up in Baxter's garden and the war was over. Mm -hmm. No, it was. I was something. Yeah, it was all, all but over. I get a letter from my mother in five days. Unheard of. My brother sent her a letter that to his, his wound opened up. Opened up and he was in Tidworth, England. Okay. So I went up to the captain and I says, Can, I got this letter, he wouldn't believe it. I go to the Red Cross, went to the Red Cross and they laughed, they said, nobody gets a letter in five days. So back to the captain and I said, they won't let me go. I says, it's the truth. So he says, okay, we'll give you passes, a bunch of passes, post-stated and all mm -hmm. that stuff. Go and see your brother. I says, how do I get there? Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> so I went from Germany all the way to England. Couldn't tell you. I stayed in a, a Salvation Army place. Okay. Stayed in a Red Cross place. I stayed in a woman's barracks. They had a special room. And then I got to, I got to Paris. I made us get out of there quick. And then I went to Southampton and got some money and things. How, how did you get in? How did you get from place to place? Was it with military vehicles or no, trains trucks. or just? Yeah, a military truck. Okay. Once I got on a plane and I got all kinds of different pickups. People fed me, mm -hmm. everything. Then I got from, I got to Southampton and I, <clears throat> I get a truck that was going into, into Salisbury, which was near where I went. I had been there before. So I get there and, uh, <clears throat> I'm looking around and I go up to the Red Cross. Here's a bunch of guys from the 1st Infantry Division is sitting there and I go and dressed in. You, you've seen how airborne soldiers are dressed. Mm -hmm. Well, I dressed full dress like that. Okay. So I go into this club and they're sitting there. Hey, look at old Mr. Dressed here, show off. So I, I'm not sure. So I'm looking for my brother. He says, What division is he? I says, In a He's in your first infantry division. He's in a hospital in Tidworth, England. They says, well, he says, we don't, what's his name? I says, Harry Barry. Well, they laugh like hell and, <laughs> and you're Russell. I told him, Russell Barry, yeah, okay. So they says, well, they kidded me and I had a good, they says, go, oh, come on with us. There was a guy there was a sergeant major and you know what they are. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. People, you could, I remember I told you what they are. So, I get, I get out of the club and on a truck with them and I get on to the base. They had me take my hat off and everything and make believe I was drunk. So the sergeant major tells the guys, he says, we're getting on, all of us there. Yeah, good women on. They took me into their barracks and went in full uniform, went and ate there and everything. They got my brother for me. Mm, nice. I spent, I think I spent about seven days there. That, that was at Tidwell, you said? Yeah. Okay. And then I had to find my way back. In time. Back to Purchase Card? Purchase Card. Okay. Wow. But I got lucky because when I was in Paris, I had a, I got a truck that was going someplace in Bavaria. Mm -hmm. You ever go there? Yep. Multiple you were in times. Bavaria? Mm -hmm. I've been to Purchase Garden too. Huh? I've been to Purchase Garden. Oh, yeah? Mm -hmm. But when you got, well, when, 
I got the poster, Scott. We were the first ones practically in there. And it was a one-way road back then. I don't know if it was it still, still is, right yeah. there. To the top? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we got all the way up to the top, and we went all through the house up there. Mm -hmm. We saw pictures of Eva Braun, everything. And then they cut everything off. But we couldn't go to the eagle's nest. And Hitler, he hardly ever went to the eagle's nest. Because once you got up there, you couldn't get down. So, um... When you saw the pictures of Ava Brown, did it, was that actually, that was in, in his house yeah. on the base of the mountain? Yeah. On, oh, up on the or top. on the actual, on the oh, hilltop? we were all the way up top. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, we were all over. Because I believe his house was actually bombed at that point, right? Because um, I think he had the eagle's nest up top, and then he actually had a residence down below. No, the eagle's nest was by itself. Right, right. And then he... His house was... That, well, maybe it was, but I didn't see it. Yeah, I was just curious if you had ever seen his, the other residence he had down there or not. I'll tell you a, a very pleasant moment I had up in Bastis Garden. I'm coming back from doing God knows whatever because the war was over. And the captain said, hey, Barry, come here. I became Barry. I was at, when I was a kid, I was Barry. He called me. He says, I want you to go to Lake Konexie. I said, so? He says, don't ask questions. Go in and get your ass packed up and get ready to go and use that bag. And I got the bag and I went out there. I go into Lake Kona see if there's nothing you can see and you go around this turn, a beautiful lake. Mm -hmm. Go into the tent and everything there. And I go in there and sign in and everything. You don't have to wear a tie. And then this girl comes and picks me. I go into this room with a feather bed. I go down to eat. They got them playing the slap dancing. You've mm -hmm. seen that when you were rolling in, mm -hmm. baby. And all that stuff. So I was there for about five days. Okay. So I go back and the captain says, how was it? I says, terrible. Nobody else needs to go there. He says, you're not going. <laughs> and then the officers went, but oh, it was, it was beautiful. It was nice. Beautiful. Food wow. was delicious. Yeah. And I jumped into the lake. And if it wasn't for the lifeguards, it would have down, drowned. It was freezing, remember? Mm -hmm. Were you there when it was cold? Uh, yes, I was. I didn't go in the lake, though. <laughs> no, but you know how cold it was? Yeah, yeah. Very cool. Um, I wanted to rewind just a little bit towards your, I guess, days before you got overseas. I'm kind of interested, basically, from the time that you were, uh, they knocked on your door and you're drafted uh, basically until you step foot in, I would assume England first, right? Yeah. Um, so you said you were drafted. Um, did you actually choose your specific branch of the military? I went down, I wanted to go in the Navy. My father was in the Navy, World War I. Mm -hmm. And they said they only have submarines and not. You said no. <laughs> So I went the I was drafted, took my basic training in camp, Blander or Blanding, Florida. Then from there I went. Okay. What did what did you think about uh the branch they had assigned you to? The what now? What did what did you think about the branch they assigned you to? What uh I guess did you did you go to basic training and yeah. then and then you were told you're gonna be an airborne or you volunteered for airborne? No. Or? I volunteered for it. Okay. <laughs> But they wouldn't take us. Mm. They cut our bake training two weeks short. Okay. So that meant you get up early in the morning and right. do everything faster. Yeah. Went up to New York and went to camp. Uh, I forget the name of it. I remember. But we went from there. We went overseas. Mm -hmm. I got off the, went across the channel, get out into the middle of this field of a 40 and 8 car. You ever heard of them? Mm -hmm. I get off there, two of us, Cosmo, Bavaria, and myself. We get off there, and nobody there. Two of us. Mm -hmm. and there's a, we put our bags down, a lock and load, and then the Jeep, they had the little peep lights. Mm -hmm. They started blinking. We went there, take us up there, about half hour drive. We get up there, and the search sergeant comes out, and he says, I'm first sergeant Bulkhead. If it makes any damn difference to you, now from Brooklyn, not the damn Bronx, New York. He says, get around there. 
You're in a hundred price tab one division. Okay. Where where did you say this is in upstate New York? This is no, this is in France. Okay, gotcha. Uh, when I could, uh, so I was assigned to the airborne. Mm -hmm. So immediately I was on the front lines and in combat the same day, and then they took us off for about three weeks later, took us back, and I took my glider training mm -hmm. in Europe. Okay. I now, did about six months training in about one week. And was that on the Waco glider? Oh, I don't know what they were. Okay. Um, what was it like saying goodbye to your folks before you shipped off? Very sad. Very sad. Because my mother, my sister, my brother-in-law was in the army in Washington, mm -hmm. and he was uh, he was a uh, some he got secret messages and delivered them. So my sister was in Washington. I was the only one home with my mother. Mm -hmm. I had to leave. I had to give the dog to the ASPCA and everything. It was very sad. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, let's see. Can you take me through just a typical day in basic training? Oh, <laughs> horror. You know it. Well, you talk to you, yeah. Get up at four in the morning, get dressed, and they start teaching you how to line up and do all the things and left, right, and come out, fall out with a helmet liner and helmet and a pair of underwear with socks and shorts and all different things. Mm -hmm. Then we went out into the Camp Landing, Florida, went out and learned the basic routines of everyday training with it. And you were training just to be a standard infantryman at that point, right? Sure. Didn't know what we were training for. Did you do, yeah. a, did you do a lot of marksmanship? Oh, yeah. Every day. M1, yep. M1 Grand? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Did you do the M1 Carbine as well? In basic training, we fired everything they had. We fought, we, we threw hand grenades. You did that too. Mm -hmm. Threw hand and Peter Miglio throws his over the thing and everybody, holy grenade, and everybody hit the ground. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, we, uh, we did that. We fired the, uh, we fired the... Thompson? The Tommy guns, the, not so much that. The machine guns, the BAR, mm -hmm. the 60 millimeter mortar, the 81 millimeter mortar, and we were around the 105 a little bit. We watched them blow up uh, landmines on a field day with that stuff. Everything, yeah. Did you shoot a bazooka? Yeah. The bazooka, yeah, we fired the bazooka too. Pete D'Amiglio. We get out on the range and the captain says, now there's, there's what we're going to shoot at mm -hmm. with the bazooka. He took the sign down. <laughs> when we went overseas, he didn't go. Yeah. He got in trouble? He, well, you know what you do with guys like that. Oh, yeah. 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 Were, were y'all shooting training rounds or actually like exploding bazooka rounds when you're in, oh, in we training? Oh, we fired live rounds. Yeah. We fired the fake ones mm -hmm. a lot too but we yeah. fired the real ones too oh yeah where, where was your basic training at though camp landing or blander i'm not sure the name florida okay is that where in florida is that north jacksonville south? okay jacksonville gotcha you dig a three foot hole and you got three foot of water yeah kind of like houston <laughs> yeah everything's sand it was horrible well and we crawled on the barbed wire while they fired Mm -hmm. machine gun over, your head. over our heads yeah. and we did all the over the oh we had one guy with us when we got down there captain thought oh captain i'll think of his name he gets out there and he says boy look at this what well, we got this time to train he says a bunch of damn kids i was 18 and a bunch of old men in here so we're never going to make salt and we all got together and we said we'll teach him we're the best Best group he ever had in his life. Wow, that's cool. We did things other people didn't do. We went up in the day room. You couldn't go in there. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was still like that. Mm, I don't recall. Officers weren't allowed there. Mm -hmm. We were in there and we practiced. And Sergeant Gerber, I'll never forget him. He goes out there and he called. It was a final day to parade. A change, huh? Nobody does a damn thing. So the guy goes, everybody won. 
not all at once, but one, two, three, down the line. Mm -hmm. The rifles, he's his left face, and everybody goes, one, two, three, four, he's everybody like that. Wow. Do you recall um, any of your other instructors and what they were like in basic training? They were all excellent. Corporal Cook, Sergeant Gerber, Lieutenant Harvey. No, he was an airborne. Lieutenant Jones, he was a nice guy. And I can't remember the captain's name now. So they, uh, um, they were teaching you more so than, I, I, I know like basic training nowadays, they're really on people. Were they like that with y'all or were they more of kind of constructive? Oh, and they were on, uh, they were on you? Bonduni all the time. Yeah. Yeah. We had to do what they wanted. Mm -hmm. No best. And we had a sergeant that was, uh, he was a useless piece of crap. And he was our platoon sergeant. And every extra detail that came up, we were volunteered for it. Mm. And to the, on the rifle range, pick up all the empty, I don't know if they still did this when you oh, yeah. pick up the empty shells, Brass, yeah. help serve the meals and everything. Mm -hmm. So one day we were out in this field, it was pretty late in the thing, about, I guess, the eighth, ninth week. And we were out there, we were the first ones there, our company, and the major was out there. We never saw a major in basic training the whole time. Right. It was a lot different when we were there than you were there. So he gets out there and he tells, uh, tells his lieutenant, he says, oh, this is sergeant, he says, go, go out and show us what the guys can do. Make it bad as you can. So he gets us lined out there and he calls Tanch Hunt. We look like brand new guys, lefty, we stumbled all over. We get back there and he says, when you guys get back, when we got down to the end, you guys get back there, you'll wish you were dead. We said, you'll wish you were dead. So we get back there and he says, didn't look so good, did it? So he says, hey, yeah, Corporal Cook, he says, you go out and drill the guys. He couldn't drill us, no matter, he was a bayonet, struck the mm -hmm. rifle, machine gun, whatever you needed to do, throwing people over, picking people, right. he did it. So we get out there and he comes out, he's standing facing us. He wants us to go right, but he's facing left. Mm -hmm. So he's left, turning, we all go right, we all went. Now that everything was supposed to, he comes back and he says, he told Sergeant Jones, he says, oh, come and see me later, he was gone. Mm. We got rid of him. Wow. That's we never got passes the way we were supposed to. Yeah. <laughs> um. Let me see here. What happened uh, in the time between finishing your training and being shipped overseas? Oh, I went home to New York for about mm, three or four days and I reported to Camp Shanks, that's a nice one. And we, we uh, I put our names and serial number and all our clothing and everything. Mm -hmm. And then they came by in Earl, well, in the afternoon or early morning, right at the breakfast, they took us on a train down to the channel, uh, down to the Hudson River. We got on the SS Wakefield mm -hmm. to go overseas. Okay. It was, there was no time lapse. And when, when did you go on the Wakefield? What, do you remember what month that was? It was 1944, probably. October, November. Okay. And when did when did you start basic training? What month? Do you recall? Uh, I think I started in August, September, October. Yeah, August. Okay. So you were in roughly th three months or so? Yeah, basic training mm -hmm. plus three months. Okay. Um, so what port did you embark from on the Wakefield? New York. Okay. Just New York City? Okay. <clears throat> And then, um, can you tell me about the experience of traveling over there? On a ship? Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. <clears throat> when we first got on, we were pretty free. We were all assigned. We had two people to a bunk. Mm -hmm. The guy that I was with, he didn't want the bunk at all. So I had the bunk to myself. So we were allowed to play cards. Dice, you mm -hmm. know, all that stuff. Yep. 
I don't know if you did or not when you took your advice, <laughs> but we were allowed to do that. Allowed to go up on a deck and go around. The, it was a Coast Guard man ship. Okay. Well, the first day out, I'm trying to find my way around the ship, like, mm -hmm. and to get this call, Private Barry reported a bridge immediately. So everybody's looking at me, so everybody got away from me. Got up there, some guy that lived in my apartment house was the bosun's mate on the ship. Okay. So then I went back downstairs. He wasn't allowed to talk to me again. So about the mm, afternoon of the third day out, they come running through. It was Coast Guard man ship. They closed all the portholes. They tell us, don't leave your bunk. They issued us a May West. Did you ever see one? Yeah, life preserver. <laughs> they gave us the May West. They told us to lock and load infantry guys. We were the only infantry guys on the ship. Had every, well, there were some others probably, but had everything, doctors, nurses, everything. So we locked up and we had to stay there. And they didn't tell us anything. We could go and eat, couldn't go up on the deck. This was before or after this uh, ship was underway? This was after we were underway. Okay. We were three days out, three and a half days out. Mm -hmm. So the next day in the afternoon, they come and they open everything else and they tell us you can do anything you want where, where you were before, but unlock, unlock, unlock your gun, unload and everything. <laughs> so then the, a big Lancaster bombers came over, tilting their winds. Mm -hmm. So the room around the ship was they got the submarine that was chasing us. Submarine chasing us? Yeah. yeah. So then they, uh, we, we, we were diverted a little bit. So we went by the White Cliffs of Dover. Mm -hmm. That was good. Ship, we didn't know port side from starboard side. So the captain would say port side, left side, whatever both of us. We saw all of that. And then we landed in Liverpool. Right. We got off the ship in Liverpool. You want me to tell you the rest of it? Yeah, please. We got off the ship in <laughs> Liverpool. The Beatles weren't there to beat us. <laughs> Run across there, and we went down to Southampton. Mm -hmm. And we got down there, and we got put on these ships to go across the channel. Do you know what kind of ships they were? Round bottom LST. LSTs. They call them. Okay. I think it was LST. Yeah. So there were there were twelve of us, and there weren't any room on the others. They weren't going to overload them for us. So we went on a ship that had trucks and jeeps and mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff. Whoa. So we get on there and guy takes us down the back of the ship. We got a great big area. They got mattresses there for us and everything. Everything was perfect. They told us we can go around the ship, but don't get lost. So they, they fed us. They let us go into their night box and get something to eat if we wanted and mm -hmm. everything. So then we landed in, uh, we landed in La Havre, okay. France. Yep. You, so you landed actually at a, at a port, not on the beach, right? Not what? You were actually at a port, not on, you didn't land the LST to a beach, Yeah, we right? landed in La Havre on this okay. LST. Right. And then they had this hill was like this, mm -hmm. and it was frozen solid. Mm -hmm. And we had to get up the hill. They had ropes, we had to pull ourselves up, 80 pound pack, extra blankets we were bringing over for the soldiers. Right. We get up to the top of the hill and guys are out there and they tell us, they, where are you going to get a hot, we're going up, they're going to get a hot meal, get up to the top of the hot sea meals, sea ration meals, all you want, I'll take three, <laughs> all you want is two. So we, they restocked us with whatever we needed and everything and gave us rifles, new rifles and everything. Came down the hill, was moist than going up, mm -hmm. got on a 40 and 8 car. You know what that is. Mm -hmm. Get out into the, it was about yeah, maybe seven, eight hours later, get out in the middle of this field. There's nothing there. So Cosmo and I, we dump our bags and put in, picked up in the Jeep and I went in the airport. Wow. And uh, I guess before you left England or possibly when you got to Le Havre, uh, was there any special equipment or anything you were issued at that point or before? No? No. Okay. But they had guys that didn't 
that left too. They had guys that were medics and all kinds of things. Mm. But we were the first. Right. They wanted us. Do you remember anything about the Harv uh, at that point that, um, not necessarily out of place, but just, you know, did you see any anything that you remember about, say, civilians or aircraft or anything well, when like we that? Went down on the, when we went down and walked through the, the town and get on the trains, there were people all over and mm -hmm. everything. Buildings were blown up and everything. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, there were lots of people. We yeah. we didn't stay any place long enough to do anything. Right. We were on our way to the front lines. Right. Understood. Um, so once you left there, how long did it take? You said you were in a jeep, right? At that point, you left on a jeep from La Havre? No, we left on a 40 and 8 car. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, and how long did it take you to reach wherever you were going? Where were you going after that? Well, we well, we got off first, the two of us. Mm -hmm. it took us about, well, I think, about six, seven, eight hours. And then where did where did you where did you? I don't remember the name, the town, and everything. Was it in France though? Oh yeah, it was okay. in France. We were in combat the next day. Okay. And what what month was this approximately? Oh, January, early January. A forty-five. 45. Okay. Um, oh, 40. No, how to be in 44? January 45. The war ended. And, yeah, January 45. Okay. So when you linked up with uh, your unit at that point, they, were they on the front lines? Yeah. Okay. And were they taking uh, fire at that point or was it kind of yeah. calm? Well, it was kind of calm, but it was two way kind of street. Right. So everybody's just kind of looking at each other. <laughs> no, 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 no. Everybody, we were in foxholes. Right. So when I got there, they took that to Sergeant Mulcahy got through telling us who he was and what we were going to do. They made us. They issued us steel helmets, mm -hmm. and we marched down this road. Nothing happens. We get down to this point. We have to go turn left on the road. Mm -hmm. and they got our first fire power. Okay. They fired at us. What was fired at you? The Germans. Was it artillery or? Yeah, well, okay. not, it was mortars. Okay. And some rifle shots. We dove into the snow. Mm -hmm. And then we got up and went down. And I don't know if I told you this part before, but Corporal uh, Webb, he gets me. Cosmo was a Jeep driver, so he wound up a jeep driver right mm -hmm. away. He gets me and he says, this is your 81 millimeter anti-tank gun. I says, I want any gifts from the army, just kidding. He says, yeah, neither did I, but it's yours from now on. Okay. So he says, now this is what it is and this is how you load it. I spent about two hours where we, where we could, we'd jump in and out of foxholes occasionally and he showed me how the gun worked. Mm -hmm. And I was, was this uh, was this mounted on a jeep? No, no not now that we towed it. Okay, it was all right. Gotcha. Okay, so it was like and a when smaller. When you had to move it, mm -hmm. you hooked it on the back. Gotcha. Okay. Um, I want to back up a little bit. When when you got to where you thought you were finally at the front lines. Yeah. Uh, kind of what was what was your initial thoughts, and then do you recall any? sights or smells or what what do you recall vaguely well i could smell there was some gunpowder mm -hmm. leftovers going around yeah i thought i wanted to go home was it noisy there or a lot of people moving around or kind of oh, quiet there were, God, there were, there were not a lot of motion mm -hmm. especially not at night there was no but no, no stuff going on a little later <clears throat> They had a peninsula, went down, we were on a river there. There was a peninsula went down into the river and they had cans tied on it. Mm -hmm. I don't think you had that. Yeah, I, yeah, I know what you're talking about for early They morning. had the cans mm -hmm. tied. Mm -hmm. Well, something got in there and those cans shook. Right. And we had a 12 box of hand grenades, so we threw all of them down there. Wow. So when they got finished, a couple of guys went 
tip throw to the stuff, nothing there. Uh-huh. So we just put an extra guard thing over to wash it. And the next day, the guys from the wire thing come in and they said, you guys are going to have to replace it. We told them BS. We're not replacing it, that's your job. Mm -hmm. So they had a captain come and he ordered us to do it. So we just made believe we we're going to do it. And our major came down and told him, that's your job, not ours. He says, we got a bunch of MPs. In it. He says, yeah, we got 17,000 soldiers up here. Oh. So he backed off and they fixed it. So were you overlooking a river right there? Yeah. That was kind of the but line. There was, was a bridge. Okay. A big bridge came across the river. Uh -huh. And you don't do you, you don't recall what city this was close to? Didn't know. Okay. Do you I know, just got there. Do you recall were you close to the border with Belgium or Germany at that point? No, I didn't know where we were. Okay. Remember I just got there. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> I knew so many other places we were. Right. Um I'm gonna take a break for a second. I don't sure. want to use the restroom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Would you like something to drink? Um, mm -hmm. went up to the thing. The colonel was getting the thing, and we held the guide arms out. Mm -hmm. Then they took us, and we had a sit-down hot meal. This was in Germany, though. I'm assuming. Yeah, this was in Germany, someplace. Who'd you say that was? With you? That was uh, Johnny Biro. Johnny Biro. Bill Pelagi, Johnny Biro, Russell Diamond. <laughs> so um is that you is that a basic training no oh no that's yeah it was after that <coughs> yeah was this after the war you took this yeah this is in Werfen, austria okay what uh why'd you get a picture you just wanted to we were walking downtown that was taken there too no, that wasn't. They were walking downtown, mm -hmm. and the guy opened up his uh, shop. Mm -hmm. The Germans would him like to take pictures. So he says, you guys want to get your picture taken? He says, what do you want? He spoke perfect English. He says, two packs of cigarettes. I said, good. It's a good deal. Oh, so you took the picture to get the two packs of cigarettes? I gave him two packs of cigarettes. Oh, you gave him. So okay. did you smoke at the time? Or no? Oh, yeah. You did? Yeah, everybody did, right? Everybody can. Yep. Well, one of those places you weren't supposed to go into for the photos, right? Did, did you tell me that one time? I... We'll get that later. Oh, okay. I just thought it come up. Okay, good. I appreciate you sharing those. Um, I wanted to start talking about kind of your combat experiences now. We've talked about your childhood, getting in service, getting over to the combat zone. Um, I just want to say, like I said, when we started, the more detail you can provide, I know it can be tough, so I, I won't push for it, but the more detail you can provide, the more valuable it becomes to, to people that hear your story down the line. So uh, no detail is too small. If you remember the place, you remember a town, you remember the people you're with, by all means, if you would please say those. A lot of names of the towns, mm -hmm. yeah. but when we left where we were there and I went back to the training, and place called Reims, France. Mm -hmm. I took the glider train, I had to take five rides to get my wings. Right. I didn't know anything about it at the point. Five rides in the glider? Yeah. Okay. That's uh, pretty dangerous. Yes. Because when they land, the little wheels, the rear end yep. always comes mm -hmm. up. Yeah, so I took the five for Mr. Basic, then I went back there and missed, I missed the car probably a week and a half or so from us. And then uh, when I went back there, I don't remember the names of any of those towns. So help me understand, uh, when did you, I guess, did, did you say you got pulled off the front lines to go do the training? Yeah. Okay. And then when was that? Do you remember what month? How long were you gone for? Uh, A couple of weeks? No. Not that long? About 10 days. 10 maybe. days. Okay. Seven days training. Okay. They showed us how you load them and right. jump in and out of them and take all the... So at that point, uh, I know they would put those little artillery pieces in the back. You were probably focused on that more yeah, than anything. Yeah, they showed us how right. to do that. And when they took the ride, when you go and you hit an air pocket, mm -hmm. pocket cheap, everything from the floor would fly up. Don't smoke and throw butts on the floor. Right. 
Don't throw anything on the floor. Pretty dangerous. Yeah. So you learned how to tie everything down? Um, we didn't no? have to do that. We did a little of that. Okay. The main thing was we learned how to get in and out of them. Okay. How to seat, be seated, and be safe. Gotcha. So did you ever did you ever have to actually take a glider into combat though? No. No? Okay. I didn't, I didn't think so at that point because I was pretty later later in the war. So, um, all right. So then from glider school, you got sent back to front lines. In D twenty seven. Where is it? Was that in France still or Germany or? We were in France yet. Okay. Did you ever go into Belgium? No. No. Okay. And for, I guess for frame of reference here, was this before or after the Battle of the Bulge? This oh, would have been after. After, after. Yeah. okay, okay. Way after. Okay. Um, this was mostly mop up stuff. Okay. They didn't. They had enough to defend themselves, and that was about it. Did you um, ever see the the Siegfried Line? The what? The Siegfried Line. Yeah, we went by there once. My brother was there. The Siegfried Line, and they were in. Uh, in the town where they couldn't get in. They blew the town up. There wasn't a wall left then. Good to know. It'll come to me. Okay. When, um, can you talk about the first time you experienced like actual combat? You, you, you mentioned some artillery being shot at you. Um, can you tell me about some, maybe some other combat experiences you have or just describe the, the scenes or you know why was there why was the combat taking place were you on the offensive was there well, objectives we were the or? okay we were chasing them back to germany mm -hmm. all the time so we'd go from one place one day when we were there and they took us off and they moved us up to a place where we we, we, we uh were supposed to get this boy i told you we're down the wrong road mm -hmm. i had to sign change and then we, we got back out of there. We went up and we supported some uh, infantry company with the anti-tank guns. Mm -hmm. We had two kinds of shells. We had a black shell that was armor piercing mm -hmm. and the other was regular artillery. Okay. All right. Um, who were some of the names of the guys you served with overseas that you recall oh, on the front line specifically? Johnny mm hmm Bill Pelagi, Robert Armstrong, Cosmo Barberi, Lieutenant Harvey, Lieutenant Schaefer from New York, Captain Barry M. Thornton. He was the greatest guy I ever met in my life. He took care of all of us like you wouldn't believe. Tell you a funny story. One time we pulled up along a place and there was bunch of Germans on the other side of the river moving around mm -hmm. said it was a tank was between two big buildings so we unload the gun on trail mm -hmm. get it all hooked up and get ready and we get just we get it we get it in there we fire a shell the tank moves and there was a ammunition truck in back of it and that thing went all over the place captain said we're shooting the tanks guys not not ammunition truck yeah. what happened with us you know he knew what happened did you uh did you end up shooting the tank did, what? did you end up shooting the tank no no just the... couldn't find it again yeah it was gone do you remember what kind of tank it was no no just one we shot at right <laughs> so the ammunition truck was it like a just a normal kind of transport pickup truck that yeah. was common over there yeah what they put well we would ship ammunition on to old all over right we loved it yeah like fireworks <laughs> yeah everybody said we got 4th of july early yep um some of the guys that you mentioned did did they serve did they uh oh they were they in normandy and everything did they did they all survive the war the guy god i think of his name oh sergeant daniels but there was another guy he had uh he had the uh, Bronze Star, Silver Star, and the, what's the one after that? Um, the, the uh, right below the Medal of Honor. 
Uh, Legion of Merit? Yeah, he got the low. Or uh, Distinguished Service Cross, rather? Yeah, it was uh, right below. He got that, and he got a battlefield commission. Okay. The first lieutenant. Wow. Boy, he was something else. Mm hmm Wow. I got to think of some more names if you want. Um, I can't today. Did Did all your friends end up surviving the war? Yes. Okay, so you, did you lose anybody close to you? Any of them close? Yeah, did, did you lose anybody close to you during the war? Uh, not that I, oh, in my neighborhood, yeah, but not there. Right. A guy named Bill Cross, he went, went to church with him. Mm. But no. Okay. Um, Who did you say your commanding officer was? Barry M. Thornton. And you, you said you had, you liked him a lot, right? Everybody loved him. Yeah. What did you like about him specifically, other than they took care of you? He was honest. He got you to do things. He listened to your stories, mm -hmm. help you if you could, and if you're wrong, you were dead. How old was he? Do you know? <clears throat> Probably late 20s, okay. mid 20s. Tell me his last name one more time. Thornton. Thornton, okay. Do you know where he was from? No, no. idea. That very little contact with them. Yeah. Did you ever uh, see or hear the enemy? Not just the artillery or things like that, but the See them and hear them, yeah. 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 What do you recall about that? I hope they don't get any closer. <laughs> what, 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 do you, what did you see or hear? Well, I saw they dress, and I don't remember, to be honest with you. We saw them from across the river. Mm-hmm. Could you, like, their silhouettes, or you could just hear their voices, or? Well, we could hear, yeah. Well, we're another place we, we, we saw them. We had some of them prisoners. Mm -hmm. Could hear them talk when they get there. How many? They had, they had guys going over all the time. Right. I only went on one night patrol, and we were only over and back. Uh-huh. Was it scary? The patrol? For me, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> what do you recall about that patrol? Didn't want to do it again. And, and that was at night, you said? Yeah. yeah. All patrols were at night for the most part, right? No. They had day things, too. We had to go over. But I didn't go on. We didn't have much. We knew we had them, and we just kept them going back and right. shoot as many as we can. Right. How many, um, how many people went on that patrol, roughly? Probably a squad. Okay. And then 12, 13 guys. did you change your uniform at all when you went on the patrol or did you just wear your normal? We had fatigues on mm -hmm. 24 hours a day. Did you travel light though? Do you didn't take a rucksack or anything like that? No, right? we had a Musette bag. Okay. All right. Was with us. Did you take any extra grenades or ammunition, water, anything like that? No, just no. went for it. How long did it last? What? The patrol couple hours no about an hour and a half okay there was nothing there so we just came we didn't want to go deep mm -hmm. who was ever leading it sergeant slice daniels he came from albany new york mm -hmm. he was leading it he had to complete authority do whatever he needed to do before you went on the patrol what what happened did did he bring everybody in to talk about what you were going to go do, what the objective oh, yeah, was? Oh, yeah, we were doing, yeah. What kind of planning did you do? We were trying to get some captives, mm -hmm. get some prisoners. Mm -hmm. They were trying to get more information, what lies ahead. Right. So you can be ready. So what was going through your mind when you're trying, when you know you're trying to capture prisoners, but at the same time, you know those prisoners... Or try to capture could try to capture Hope it your, goes my way. You what? Hope it goes my way that yeah. we get them and them not. We lost the whole patrol one time. Yeah. He come, he sent the patrol over and they were all captured. Wow. And we didn't want to be captured. They didn't have any place to put us. Mm -hmm. They were sh sh probably killing them on front lines. I don't know that for sure. Right. Were you going through scenarios in your head trying to think of if I see them, what am I going to say to them? What am I going to do? Well, yeah. yeah. Oh. <laughs> You're captive. <laughs> right. Can you, um, those POWs you mentioned before, what do you remember about them specifically? Do you, do you recall how they acted? Oh, they were, 
they were very scared because they had told them stories of what we were going to do to them which were not true mm -hmm. we were not allowed to harm them at all mm -hmm. <laughs> nothing how many pow's were there uh, probably two two were they young boys old men oh yeah they were young really young we ran into them, some real young ones later in the story if you want me to tell it now sure we were on our way up the Baxter's garden and we were mm, I don't know two days away and we went in this town and it was up everything's up hills remember mm -hmm. and we they put drop white sheets out they surrendered we get to this place there's no sheets mm -hmm. no surrender mm -hmm. so we entrailed all our guns and got ready we're going to take the town down down and the captain says no let's wait <clears throat> so a couple of guys almost got shot so we hit the ground and everything one guy got grazed off the arm so we were going to start and he says hold a minute the white flags came out mm -hmm. so we sent the patrol up and they talked to the people they were the Nazi kids in their Hitler youth mm -hmm. 12 14 years old they held the town captive wow so we were going to go and chase them and the captain called the major and the major said no let them go somebody else will get them mm -hmm. those kids were nasty yeah I never, I, I know I saw some and probably talked to them and didn't know it. Wow. Because they were in civilian clothes at that point. Wow. Wild. Um, do you have any, do you have any times that you recollect, recollect that you maybe engaged the enemy that you knew you were shooting? What? That you engaged the enemy? Did, do you recall actually seeing people while you were shooting or was it? you were just kind of reacting and no we could see them on the other side mm -hmm. our water truck got blown up we didn't have water so we took the canteens had a way of tying them together mm -hmm. had to get down to the river and get the water out and put that big pill in them i'm sure you did it too mm -hmm. and down there and they pop at us and we pop at them yeah what i guess once y'all shot back what what happened do you break contact or yeah we didn't have any real direct contact with them okay a couple of times we did then we weren't where there was a river though and they were just far enough back right did did do you know if if y'all actually hit the enemy or were they too far away to know oh well, we could see them yeah so you y'all inflicted casualties on the enemy though no i didn't know if we did not yeah, yeah. We, we know we hit some because you could see them how they went down right Okay. Um, you mentioned artillery. How often was artillery coming down on where well, you were? It was at? very light back then. Light. A couple of times a day. Okay. Not like in Bastogne and places. That was right. Just one continuous thing. Right. Did, were you ever in a foxhole inside of Germany, or mostly just France? No, we were in some in Germany too. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> What were the kind of sights and sounds you remember from the artillery? How close did it get? And did you smell the, the gunpowder or did you see trees burst or? When we got into the big towns, yeah, you could, but when we got into the big towns, everything was, they were gone out of there then. Mm -hmm. We went down to Alsace Lorraine. Right. And I forget the name of the damn town now. But we were in oh, Salisbury. Okay. Went down to Salisbury, they were all gone. Okay. Then we chased them all the way back up to Birch's Garden. Did they set up any roadblocks or anything like that? that oh, you're yeah, pulling? sure. What types? Trees sometimes or just logs across the road, things, yeah. Interesting. What were, uh, if you recall, what were some of your most frightening experiences? When the shells come in. Mm -hmm. When you can hear them. We had one time, we had a shell landed eh, far enough away that nobody got hurt but we, we couldn't hear good or anything and the medics came by saying anybody bleeding you're not bleeding they just went on right had a couple of those were they real loud when they landed oh yeah <laughs> shake your insides you know why you hit the ground right yeah because the shell goes up and out mm -hmm. 
What were some of your most exhausting experiences? Walking. Walking. Places. How how far would you typically have to walk when you were moving? Well, I didn't. We had to walk behind the gun sometimes because everybody couldn't get in the jeep. Mm -hmm. Stuff they had, eh, maybe five six miles. Mm -hmm. But it was a lot of snow. Right. Were you on roads or through trails? Wherever you could go. Right. Wherever the gun and the jeep could go, we went. Right. The big thing was the gun. Mm -hmm. What kind of maintenance did you do on the gun? Did you have to clean it and things like that? Oh, yeah. Always cleaned it, especially the housing. Take it out and oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. We wanted it to fire. Right. How much ammunition did you carry? I'm assuming you carried it in the Jeep, right? Yeah, we carried in a couple of boxes. Okay. How many rounds is that? Do you know? Don't remember. Okay. <clears throat> I'll tell you one, though. We went there, uh, we were at this place on, on the front lines, and we were on, and we came over in a Jeep, and the road was there, and we got on the lines there, and we, we were firing at a, at a bunker, mm -hmm. and we left, we left the next day. We were there overnight, and there was quite a bit of stuff going on. So when we tried to get out of there with the gun and the jeep, the uh, road was gone. So we had to try to go across this thing with the jeep and the gun, mm -hmm. and the cover came off the gun and got trapped around the wheel. Mm -hmm. So we were ready to come back. We got back and they're quiet enough for a little bit. I ran back and pulled the cover off the gun. So we trained, we got, we saved the gun and a bunch of guys. Hmm. What, uh, where was that, um, bunker you were, that was, was oh, that in Germany? On the German side. Okay. So then he brought in a 155. Mm -hmm. It was gone. Wow. Did you have 155s? I think we did. But I never, I never was really around them. I don't re really recall. They got the bunk. It was gone. Was that on the Siegfried line, maybe? Huh? Was that on the Siegfried line? That no, area? No, my part, Siegfried line went all over. Might right. have been further down. Okay. All but right. we were mainly pushing to get into, deep into Germany, mm -hmm. so we could get them to surrender. Right. Okay. And they did on my birthday. Yeah. You know that story, uh -huh. right? Yeah. May 7th, <laughs> yep. 1945? Yeah. Lucky you for captains, you. Yeah. our captain calls us out in fatigues. We were in dress uniforms. War was almost over. Gets us out there and he says, hey guys, he said, I got some news for you. And everybody says, oh, front lines again. We were out for a week or so. Mm -hmm. He says, the war is over. Wow. And we went crazy. So that we, we took the German people out of the houses and put them in other houses. We were all in one place. We went down and I spoke a little German and I told the women that the war was over. They said, thank God. They were tired of it too. Wow. So they came up and they cleaned for us and everything. Packs of butts and chocolate. Cigarette for baby, chocolate for bambo. Mm. Do you know what town you were in there? Huh? Do you recall what town you were at at that time? No, I don't. It was on the way to Bass to Scott. There was another one going along on the Audubon, mm -hmm. and there was a big field. They had the whole, they had the field cut out, and the camouflage, they had planes in there. Oh, you saw that? Wow. Yeah. Jet planes or regular planes? Oh, I don't know what they were. I think they were jets. Mm -hmm. I saw a jet. Wow. I'll go back and tell you that. We were on this. River room was a big river. This plane came down like that. P-38s 20 minutes later. Wow. The Germans, oh, we were all watching it. But we got up in this, I forgot what I was telling you now. We got up into the town. You said the the field was cut out and you saw planes on the other Oh yeah, the plane was in there. And it was a place for us to have a rest call. Okay. So everybody went, so a couple of guys got up on a plane and someone took a camera. Here comes the MPs and 
they wanted the camera and they had a whole company surrounded man for man and they said I'll tell, we'll tell you what we'll do we'll let you guys go like nothing happened if you put that camera down so we made a big you know you do mm -hmm. it and the camera was there and we went why do you think they didn't want you around the planes they what why do you think they didn't want you around the planes oh they didn't want us to take anything ah oh, gotcha they didn't want us to take them and they were they were very interested in the jets right wow you know how they shot them down don't you but they had when they made a turn they had to go around and they come up underneath them mm-hmm Interesting. Um, back to your kind of combat experiences. Do you recall a time where you felt just kind of lonely or detached in general? Lonely? Mm -hmm. All the time. A lot of time, yeah. Of course, you couldn't. There wasn't a lot to really say. You talk about the food. Mm -hmm. we, we lived mostly on C rations and K rations. Mm -hmm. And trying to stay warm a lot of the time. Yeah, <laughs> stay warm. We got into this town, never forget this one, Mannheim, Germany. Mm -hmm. And there was a girl who was taking care of my wife. She was in the wax and she was there. Oh, wow. <clears throat> so there's a food truck comes through and it broke down. So we, we only were in there, we only took it two or three days before. So we're going around this thing and there's the truck. We get out and we and we're all loaded, lock and load. Whoever in there, what's the password for today? How the hell could we know the password? So they told us who they were and we went around and checked them out. So the food, the truck's loaded with food and they go into a different town where they had to go from Mannheim to get to a road. Right. So they needed a part for the truck. Mm -hmm. So we called the motor pool sergeant and he looks at the food and everything had the cook come. He looked at it, mm, we could do something with that. Mm -hmm. We didn't have the part. So we got the food. Oh, nice. And we went around that it, we, we had a hard time gathering pots and stuff. We got a hot meal out of it. Wow. Good for you. <laughs> yeah, good for us. Yeah. yeah. Do you, uh, what were some of your most exciting experiences, uh, again, in combat, not after, but when you're say on the front lines or traveling or do you recall anything exciting eh, not really like i got that i can think of yeah it was exciting that we kept going forward mm -hmm. and then we it was exciting when we were going up the bats garden when we got there and, and bavaria oh god i would love to have gone back there it was beautiful what was exciting just the the scenery oh yeah the scenery people mm -hmm. and then after, after, the, after the war was over we went out on jeep patrols and we go out and there's a one place you've seen it out in the place nothing around it mm -hmm. we go up there and there's a guy in the house and we open the door and he says you dick she can't come in here broken english and we told him bullshit buddy we can do any damn thing we want he was a, a nazi major mm -hmm. SS. He was still SS in uniform? On MR, oh, and, wow. Um, so we just told him to sit down and don't move. Wow. Got the MPs coming, they took him in. And was, I guess, did he become a, a captive at that point? Like a, a POW? Like he hadn't been captured? No, he wasn't captured. Wow. He got away. He was probably stationed up in Bastis Garden. Mm -hmm. Wow. We had, we had all the big generals up there. Mm hmm in the back this half. Right. We had to salute them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You see now. Yeah. <laughs> do you uh do you recall what your most unusual experience was? I'm asking the hard questions now. <laughs> yeah, unusual. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, we had one. We were out in this Jeep, there were four of us. And we go out and we wanted to find out what the town was. We were in before Bavaria and we wanted to see what we needed to do in that 
what was ahead of us so we could gear up and everything because mm -hmm. we were low on everything. So we go out there and we look and we go out into the and we get to the end of the town, the next town's miles and miles away. Some lieutenant colonel come in, he captured the whole company by himself. Wow. And was that lieutenant colonel from the 101st as well? Oh, yeah. Do you remember his name? Yeah, Lieutenant Colonel Coons. Was he a battalion commander? Lieutenant Colonel? Yeah, mm -hmm. battalion commander. Okay. How did he capture him all by himself? He was... He was always ahead of everybody. They surrendered to him specifically? Yeah. And I met him after the war. Wow. Went to an Airborne Association meeting up in Marshall, Texas, I think, at that town. He was there. I lived in uh, Hallsville, which is the next town over from Marshall, up until about two years ago. <laughs> they had a Airborne thing up there. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah. What year was that? Oh. God, I don't remember years. My wife and I went to it. Seventies, eighties? Yeah, probably back the eighties. No, probably nineties. Nineties? Wow. What um we're about to move past the adjective questions, but what what was your most uh humorous experience that you recall? <clears throat> well, this is in basic training. We took, there were swamps down in Florida, mm -hmm. and they had this big log that you had to go across the thing, and one of the nine comes, he put something on it, we'd slip off. Mm. And then he'd go through and he'd clear it off. When the nine comes, I, we went back and we put it on, and he fell in the water. <laughs> we were sitting on the other side watching. <laughs> That's funny. That's very funny. What was uh, some of your most memorable experiences? Oh. <clears throat> and who who were who were the people you were with? Who what? And who were you with? Oh God, I don't know. <clears throat> Nothing that I can think of really that memorable about things that we did. Getting that when I took those pictures, I remember that. I had the guide arms out. And you know how heavy something gets when you hold it out there too mm -hmm. well? Get tired. So we were starting to drop them, and I said, guide arms up. Pull the guide arms up, and the second lieutenant comes running out. We're from all different units. Who gave that order? I said, I did, sir. He said, would you rather have us drop them down there? He says, don't you ever give another order. I just said, yes, sir. And he went back, and he reported me to the captain. Uh -oh. The captain said, good job. Wow. Like I tell you, we we would, uh, with our captain, we were a little bit different. Right. Hmm. Um. Here's a tough one. Did you ever see any uh, anybody, um, any dead bodies in combat? Yeah, I saw them out in the field. Americans, Germans, civilians. Both sides, I guess. Both sides. Could, really couldn't tell. What went through your mind? Did you try to stay away? Me. <laughs> yeah. I hope it ends. Right. But we knew the war was coming to an end anyhow. Mm -hmm. Just what? some stupid, like when Berlin, it went on forever. Those, that, that specific instance, why were they out there? Was it artillery or? Who? The, when you say you saw Americans and Germans. Well, no, they were just dead from the battle. That was gotcha. ahead of us. Oh. Uh, no, I didn't see many. How long were they out there for? Do you know? Probably a day. A day. They picked them up fast. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's well, see. I saw one in a, <clears throat> not, not anything like that. We were in this uh, town in France that we just liberated, and there was a bunch of nurses and wax in there, and the nurse captain and this one guy with us, he wouldn't salute her. And she wanted him, she was going to get him put away. Mm -hmm. She said, that bar gets a salute no matter what happens. Mm -hmm. So we finally convinced him to do it. He had the two or three purple hearts. He had the silver star and all kinds of stuff. Mm. He didn't belong there anymore. And then we had another guy. I can't think of his name. He was a sergeant. He had a jeep with a machine gun, a whole bunch of them. Mm -hmm. When the war was over and we were going home, 
he was crying the war was over now he can't kill Germans Wow because he lost two squads Wow so he wanted payback he didn't go home with us. They sent him to some place in Germany. Right. Get his mind straight now. What did what did uh, what did the war have on your physical and mental health personally? Not much. Well, it had a little on my like when I got married one night. I yelled to my wife, "Hit the ground!" Stuff like that. That's all I had. Yeah. Did Did you witness anybody that had shell shock or anything like that? No. No. Just that one guy. Right. But he didn't have it bad enough to really know it, but he, he was... Yeah. A little deranged. Um, let's see. You didn't, you didn't stumble on any concentration camps or anything like that, right? Yeah. Which one? Uh, we were going to the front lines and we were going to buy this. I don't remember which one it was or anything about it. And we stopped and wanted to offer help. We could see and see the Jewish people with the bands on and stuff, but they made us. MPs came running out and got us more, and they don't want us to give them any food or anything because they were killing themselves. They hadn't eaten. Yeah, their stomachs would. And the guys, they naturally gave them all they could. So they rationed everything out to them. Were they in striped prisoner uniforms or? Yeah, they were right. we could see the prisoners, but just a quick glance. How far away were they? Oh, here across to the park, so, off the road. Wow. So did they just liberate them that day? They what? Do you think they just li just had liberated that camp that day? Oh, a couple of days before. Mm -hmm. hmm. Interesting. Is there anything else about that you could tell me? No, I don't no? remember anything more. You just kept going? Oh, yeah. <laughs> We kept banging, yeah. Yeah. Moved us along. Wow. Um, let's see. Can you tell me about all the, uh, what you felt seeing all the destruction done to the cities and the urban areas? And can you describe the scenes once you went through those cities? Yeah, they were all bricks laying down. Homes were ruined and houses. Big buildings were down. The planes dropped bombs. They they really bombed all over there. What were the people doing? They were looking for food, looking for a place to live or anything. We we went through them fast. We weren't in combat in any of those places. Mm -hmm. Did uh, did anybody any of the civilians come and try to talk to you, or did they just leave you alone? No, we went through pretty fast. You just drove through. Yeah, we. we Combat was all, we were always headed for the front lines. Right. Okay. Um, did you know of anybody that ever became a POW or got captured? Yeah. Guy that sit across the desk from me at work, Gil Martin. Mm -hmm. He was captured in Italy. What was his name? Gil Martin. How do you spell his last name? M-A-R-T-I-N. Oh, Martin. Okay. <clears throat> And I'll tell you, I sat across from we, we changed desks, regular, different guys. Mm -hmm. Everybody worked together, and he wouldn't tell you much. Yeah. When war, when when he finally got released, he was up Lake Connex. No, not Connex. It's a big lake in Italy. They put him up there for a couple of weeks to. Como. Como, Lake Como, in a luxury house and everything. Oh wow. But he was captured a long time. Wow. Interesting. What was the most impressive enemy weapon that you saw? The most what? Impressive enemy weapon that you saw. Tank, plane, 88. artillery. 88. What was impressive about it? Could do a lot of damage and it was accurate. Yeah. Quick, a lot of firepower. Did you... Did you see it close up or you just knew about it from afar? No, we saw it pretty close up. Mm -hmm. Went by some place now. One there and we got to look into it. Yeah. Um, what was the most impressive place that you saw while overseas? I guess up in Baxter's Garden, all of it. It was. And when we got there, <coughs> 
there was a train. You saw the railroad tracks there? I don't think I did. Well, there was railroad tracks there, and they had trains there. They had all the German art on there. And they had guys from our division and MPs guarding it. Mm -hmm. And you could go by and you could... Oh, look, yeah, oh. <laughs> you could look into it. Mm -hmm. This wow. was a Zeiss Iconda. That's a nice camera. <laughs> My this was taken from a German pres German colonel or something. Did you get uh is there a film in it still? No. 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 We took it out. Oh. We took it out. Did, I wish. Did you get it developed? No? There's no, no there was no oh, film in it. It's gotcha. empty. We went online and checked how to take it apart and Yeah, you probably I forget who I got it from. I think my father in law had it. Very cool. Yeah, these ices are hard to hard to find over here. You find the old Argus bricks and things like it's that. Probably but, worth a lot of money. Yeah. I, I I don't know about this one, but I see these old Zeises for two or three hundred bucks easily. Yeah. I got a question for you. Sure. Can you find out or is there any way we can find out how many how many survivors there are from World War Two in the airborne? Still live, still alive. Still alive? Yeah. No, I mean, you can't get like a, a definitive number because a lot of people um, left the service and never wanted anything else to do with it, right? But uh, what I probably can help you with is find, um, say, like a 327th or just a 101st organization. Well, I belong to that. I okay. Think, but I let it. Well, I've been, I've been, I had my wife had dementia for two years. Mm -hmm. And I was with her 24 hours. It's just a lot of little things I used to do. Going. I still got my airborne card. So what do you... Um, do you I was want, wondering how many of us are alive. Do you want to talk to anybody? Or just want, you're just curious to know how well, many I are left? I a number on here, I think. It's, 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 unfortunately, it's not, not too many anymore. Um, back to my, my grandfather. Out of his naval group uh he used to go to reunions and there was you know 150 at one point then it was 50 about 10 years ago and then oh, I must have left it at home. he was uh in my box he well, in the service just from world war ii um they do report oh yeah number, huh? but you're always like a year behind or so the ones i read and... mm -hmm. <clears throat> oh cool but i'm you know specific uh Italians and things like that I don't know right that's cool they keep in contact with you huh <laughs> no I haven't whatever date this was I haven't been in Kai's to talk to him on the phone mm -hmm. this was good to through 20 12 months mm -hmm. 20 and I had to let it go I don't know why but I did right things got tough at the end with my wife. Yeah, I understand. She couldn't do anything. But she's got a, um, she's out at the Veterans Memorial, uh, buried there, so there's a place for him. Where is that at? Studenter Airline. Where? Oh, okay. Veterans Here in town. Memorial Highway. Yeah. Gotcha. He's okay. What have I got? At the Veterans Cemetery. At the cemetery. Oh, yeah, my mom was Beautiful. buried in the Veterans. Hmm. So want to see it? Sure. It's beautiful. I'm trying to think of where Steubner Airline is. That actually by it's George actually Bush? Veterans Memorial, so it, it would be pictures, pictures, off pictures. of uh, Beltway. Pictures. Towards the okay. airport. Okay, yeah, yeah. And, uh, How the hell will I get the pictures in the yeah. <laughs> So it's, it's within a mile of Beltway. Okay. Of I've been over there. But it's been a long time. Like I said, I'm not from this area, so. It's, it's beautiful. I mean, uh, COVID didn't help me learning the Houston area very much. Yeah. <laughs> so. It made you stay in. Yeah, I might have been here two years, but I've only got to really explore for about a year now, so. Is that your home where you were before you came here? Or? I'm from Plano, north of Dallas. Plano, okay. Yeah. Yeah. But military moved me everywhere, and then. First job was with BP and out in East Texas. Okay. Very nice.
Very nice. And I go right alongside it. Yeah. Or on top of it. Well, you're to the Well, they replace the headstone. Side by side. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Then they'll turn her <laughs> facing the I like that direction, better. and he'll be all the military that served will be their headstone <clears throat> faces the same way. <laughs> So she was military? No. no she was no. Military. Okay. <laughs> okay, gotcha. Okay, I understand. We had a choice. We were Episcopalians. They have a column bear them on the church grounds. Mm -hmm. Or we could have gone up to New York and be buried with our families up there. But every time I looked it all over, the families down here, what's left of us, <clears throat> we could go here and have taps on Memorial Day and wreaths and different things. Well, I'll go there. She said, okay. Yeah. She was opposed to it for a while, and near the end of her life, when she was still good, though, she said, let's go there. Yeah. Cool. We work together. Yeah. Partnership. Um, I got a few more. I got, I got this many more questions. You've done, you've done four pages, I think, already, so okay. we're doing good. <laughs> we'll, we'll get it done. Um, let's see here. Well, I, I, I kind of touched on this already, but when you were over there, um, how did you interact with the citizens and the civilians? Oh, the, the civilians? Yeah, how did they treat you? Uh, or? Yeah, well, when, where we were up in Bansas Garden, that's a different class of people. You know, that's the only place I really was in Germany. But the people interacted with us very well because... We had a mess hall, I had to walk down this big hill, it rained a lot. Mm -hmm. um, when we got finished eating, you dump your food in the, in the first one, and you rinse it out down the line. Mm -hmm. Well, the kids used to come in and eat the food out of there. Mm -hmm. So we found a way of getting the big cans that the food came out of, mm -hmm. put, and when we take our food, we put it in there. So they could see that we were going to take care of them. Mm. And they had a little German girl, she was the cutest thing, about six years old. She'd walk and hold your hand and everything. Mm. So we found out, they found out that we weren't what the Germans said we were. Got along good with them. Wow. Very good up in, in Barrett's Garden. It's interesting you say that because that area specifically, I mean, was the center of National Socialism. Yeah. I mean, that's where the higher-ups had their personal residencies. So do you did you ever get the opinion, um, maybe with some of the older older people there, oh, yeah. that they resented you? Or oh, that, yeah. Yeah? They turned but their they nose never, up? They never let us know mm -hmm. what you could see and did they maybe walk away if they could or something like that. But they never said anything to really upset you. Right. We had all the big German generals down in the Bansas half. You can look that up. What what were they doing? A lot of them were sick. They had nurses and all kinds of stuff. They were coming up into the colonels, up with the colonel. I guess they were getting information from them and everything. Were they under lock and key? Were they what? Were they under lock and key? Or could they do whatever they wanted? They could walk around. Mm. Um, sure, they were watched very closely, but yeah, they were. And uh, we weren't allowed to go in there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> wow. Do you, uh, do you have any other memorable experiences from, from Berchtesgaden um, in regards to the enemy or anything like that? No, I told you about the train, the pictures on the train. And one day I was on guard duty with the Lieutenant Schaefer. We were downtown and here comes these four guys with four girls, non-fraternization. So we stopped them and they saluted freedom, respect. And he says, these are Hungarian girls. Mm. They're girls from all over up there. I'll tell you another one. When we got out there, we went out on a patrol and went out in the woods. And there's this beautiful hot cabinet, bunch of women in there, Russian women. They use them for all, anything you can imagine. Dusha and nausea. I talk to them a lot because I was assigned to that area. Then one day I said to the guys, I said, hey, oh, let's go back. He says, I think it's not good. I said, look, there's something between those trees 
Nobody in my life in New York, New York State, ever cut a trail through trees like that. The jeeps will fit, let's go. That cabinet back there, they had about 15 girls back there. And they were almost starved to death. They didn't know what was going on. Mm. Were these like slave laborers? Oh yeah. Yeah, the yeah. Hungarian girls as well? Oh, they were all slave laborers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So now that the, uh, the, the Germans kind of had been captured, they didn't really have a, a place to go or? They didn't have any place to go. You've seen movies and things where they came ro rolling in. Yeah, they didn't have any place to go. So how did y'all treat them? Did you take care of them or they just? Yeah, they, they had places, they, they had a place, I can't remember the German name for it, but these uh, blonde haired, blue eyed women had babies with the blonde haired, blue eyed soldiers, mm -hmm. uh, a race of superiority. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, we, they had to go in and help them to feed them and take care of the babies. We did, I don't know who did that. Yeah. <clears throat> Can you describe your living conditions while overseas? Um, After the war? Let's, let's say during the war. In the foxholes? Sure. Not very comfortable. Not very good. Scary. You didn't want to get caught in there. A tree could fall down on you. Scary. Mm -hmm. did, you share, did you share it with one other person? Your foxhole? <laughs> one time... There were some shells coming and we jumped into the foxhole. We jumped in with a lieutenant colonel. There was three of us who could hardly fit in there. Mm -hmm. We said, so we'll get out. He says, oh no, we fight together, we die together. We're mm -hmm. all on first airborne division. Wow. Airborne forever. <laughs> you ever give that call out? If there's an airborne guy around, he'll come to you. Really? I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> Did you know there were five divisions? Of? Airborne. Explain. Five airborne divisions. Oh, 82nd? 11. They were in the Pacific. Uh huh. 13, 17, 82nd, mm -hmm. and 101. 101, yep. Okay. Yep. Four of the divisions were over Europe, and the 11th was over in the Pacific. Yep. Yep. Um, did you have plenty of supplies when you were over there in combat? Sometimes? Sometimes they didn't get there. What was, uh, what do you recall being short? Ammunition, medical Ammunition, supplies? Water. Water. C rations, K rations. But the biggest, the most important K ration was the nighttime one. Why is that? Three cigarettes and toilet paper. Ah. <laughs> toilet paper was pretty prime. You know that, too. Yeah. Toilet paper was pretty prime. Right. <clears throat> Definitely didn't throw it away, did you? No, <laughs> but people did. They threw the boxes away. We'd pick them up because we had a cord of some kind. We could tie it on the barrel of the guns. Mm. To keep water out of it? Huh? To keep water out of it? Take water out of it? Well, you said, you said put the box on the barrels of the guns? Yeah, just tie it around the outside of the gun. Uh-huh. Because we had enough of this to store it. Okay. And then later on, if somebody needed them, we could... Gotcha. Throw, oh, we eat them ourselves. Right. What was the weather like over there? During the war? Mm -hmm. The coldest it was ever in my life was in Le Havre, France. Really? <clears throat> the wind blows in off the bay and it was about 20, 30 miles an hour. And we could hardly move around. Mm -hmm. I still had to go up that rope. Do you remember, do you remember once you got out of Le Havre, was it particularly muddy? Yeah, it was rainy and it wasn't not a good time of the year. Mm -hmm. Did it snow a lot? Yeah, oh, we went through snow one time. We were going up on a front line. There was an infantry company alongside of us. Mm -hmm. And the guns, we slid off the road with one of the jeeps and the guns. Mm -hmm. So we tried to get the guys to help put us back on the road. They didn't want to do it. Mm -hmm. And we told them, when you get there going, those tanks are getting you. You wish he would have helped us. All right. Hmm. Gun got up there quick. Yeah. Did uh, Did you ever go to a USO show? Oh yes. Was it anybody famous? Yes, Mickey Rooney. Oh wow. We were we were in a town 
Mm-hmm. And Bob Hope was there. Mm-hmm. And we were going by with the gun. We were moving around all over the place. One time we were, we were here and we'd go up there. To, oh, so finally the captain says, put one gun there, one here, one there. Mm-hmm. And just say, anybody ask you, we're moving, we're moving. He was a good guy. But yeah, they went to, we went to the, tried to get in to see Bob Hope and he said, guys are dressed wrong. Mm-hmm. We were obvious. Yeah. We, also, we all had the airborne thing on our shoulders and stuff like that. Yeah, we had Mickey Rooney in uh, Mormelan La Petite, and everybody had gone except our country company. So we were the only ones in there, and he shook hands with everybody and said, don't ask any questions about the Hollywood women. He says he doesn't know, and <laughs> there was some women in there, and they were singing and, you know, entertaining us, and they left right away, and the captain says, whoa, whoa, where are you going? He says, well, we were talking. He says, listen, there isn't a guy in this company that'll lay hands on you, or say anything nasty, or he'll be in jail, I promise you. They stayed and they talked. It was, wow. It was nice. And the show was beautiful. The Kingsmen were with him. What what type of show did he do? Oh, singing, dancing. He was very talented, you yeah. know. He was one of the most talented people in Hollywood. Yeah. According to the show I saw. He played the drums in movies. and did Yeah, it was very nice. It's funny he mentioned he didn't know anything about the Hollywood women, considering how many Hollywood wives he had. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, yeah. But I, he didn't want to say anything yeah. to, the, to the troops. Right. You know? That's he, was, he was doing what he was supposed to do. He may have even been in the army. I don't remember. Yeah, I'm not, I don't know about Mickey Rooney. Interesting. So did you actually end up seeing Bob Hope as well, or no? Oh, Mickey no. Rooney? Okay. No room for us. Yeah. Um, well, I saw some in the States uh, down in, in basic training, mm-hmm. uh, but they weren't, you know, that impressive in the States because yeah. we had the movies on the post. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so you said the highest rank you achieved was Buck Sergeant, right? What's that? Sir? You were a sergeant? Was, yes. Okay. Um, when did you get promoted? Oh God, I, at the, near the end of the war. Okay. This uh, guy comes along one time, in, in the, in the war was practically over, and he says, come with me for the next three days. I says, yes, Sergeant, I will. Left flank, right flank, rear march, forward march, left right, hand salute, press right, press, press right, right. Three days doing this, what the hell am I doing this for? He says, here's your corporal stripes. Wow. We didn't have any school to go to. Wow. So he just taught you on the fly? Taught you on the fly. Why did, why did you get promoted? Was it just your time or replacing somebody or? Didn't know anybody. Yeah. All right. So I for, guess I did some things they liked or saw some ability. Right. So, but for most of the war, you were a, a private, right? PFC. PFC. Okay. First, private first class. All right. <laughs> When uh, when did you get promoted to private first class? When we finished basic training. Okay, and then when did you? Not make... everybody. Right, you did better than other people. Well, some group of us, they obviously saw something that they liked that the other guys didn't have. Which is probably why you ended up with the eighty second and the hundred first. Hundred first airborne. Yeah. yeah. When, so when did you, uh, you said when you made corporal, when did you make sergeant? Oh, I can't remember. Was it on the way yeah. home? And I wasn't sergeant in combat. I think it was at the end of the war. Okay. okay. I was a sergeant when I went down to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. You had some kind of unruly guys though, didn't you? You had to deal with? Huh? Didn't you have a few unruly guys, or at least one you told a story about you had to deal with? I can't hear. You said you had some unruly guys you had to deal with? Oh, yeah, I had a couple of guys. Bound in the barracks. One guy was playing cards on his lunch hour with the guys, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm sitting behind him one day, and I saw something I didn't like. So I went in and I told him, Captain, I said, look up his record. He was a Las Vegas dealer. 
Remember now, we got 50 bucks a month. They got 50 bucks a month back then. Mm -hmm. By the time you paid for your laundry and different things, wasn't a lot left. So I sat there and watched some counter money. It was one of the maybe four bucks every day. Mm -hmm. You can't do that. Cards got to go the other way. So then one day, and I told him I stopped playing cards. He says, no. I says, I'm telling you, stop playing cards. No, I says, it's an order. He says, no, I'm not going to do it. So I went in and told, come in, I got to put him in jail six months. Wow. You know what an order is, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> See, I don't to hear that come back. <laughs> I had one other guy, and I can't remember. Oh, uh, we, I was sitting there. I just came back from church, and the guys, without us nine cars being involved, got the captain to let them on Sunday morning from maybe six o'clock till nine o'clock, papers all over, do what you want. Nine o'clock, it's clean. So I have this guy who comes, I could come back, come in. I told him, I says, and then clean his stuff up. He says, F you, Simon Barry. I says, well, look, he says, you've been a pretty good guy. Make believe I didn't hear. I just came back from church. I feel pretty good. First sergeant's in back of me. He tells him the same thing. So he says, go and sit in your bunk and don't move. He goes in and takes a shower. Nobody else goes in. They're pretty big guys. Mm -hmm. First sergeant. Yeah. So he comes out. Then the other guys went in. The guy left. An order. Wow. Do not leave your bed. So... He, I had the job to stay there to see when he came back. He doesn't come back all day. All the guys helped me. That night he didn't come back. So the next day he do not come back until late in the afternoon. Comes and sits in his bed. I would have told him they took him away. They put him away for 20 years. Really? Thou shalt not curse the first sergeant. Yeah. Yes, first sergeant. Wow. You know that from... Oh, yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. See, I well, like that one. Twenty years seemed yeah. really harsh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, they, Did, what, they was have, he deserted? They have Did. a way of doing things. When somebody else can't get it done, they have that just that lack of going in and saying, "Look, guys, let's do it, huh?" Yeah. And everybody just jumps into an officer tells you to do it. You're going to do it because he's, he's an officer, and you have to do it. But they just have that way. Yeah. Did um, can you tell me how about how your tour ended? How what? How your tour ended? Um, I remember you said something about your your brother and going visit him, but you were sent back to Germany, right? At that point. No, I never went back to Germany. No. Okay. So how did? I guess what decided that you were going to go back to the U.S. The whole division went back. Okay. We went down to the town of Sans, France, and our regiment was in Sans, France. Mm -hmm. And on Thanksgiving Day, they drew uh, things out in our company. We had dinner with the colonel, lunch with the colonel, Thanksgiving Day. And old Kirby says, yeah, another goddamn Thanksgiving. He was half yeah, I'm sure. He says, I'm going to get the goddamn neck of the chicken or the the back part of the thing with no meat, and I can't have a drink, and everybody else will get one. So they come out, and they bring him a whole turkey and everything mm -hmm. right in front of him. Wow. Yeah, that, that, then, then uh, the colonel says, we're, we're going home. What month was this? This was probably, oh, uh, November. Okay. It was after that. Right. So we came. Oh yeah, home. you said Thanksgiving. We came home yeah. on the Queen Mary, mm -hmm. landed in New York, went to Camp Shanks, made the victory parade for World War Two in New York. Wow, how what was that like? The parade? Mm -hmm. How far? No, what was it like? Beautiful. Was I there, was proud to do it. Is there confetti or cars like an actual parade or just people actual walking around? Parade. World War Two, yeah. Army parade. You had to march. Oh, buddy, we practiced every day. Mm. And when we had an incident, coming home on the train, I had to go on 50th Street, 5th Street, and this guy jumps on the train and he grabs a, that's a, a front end of the, 
train. There's always somebody standing watching the tracks. Mm. Guy grabs his wallet. There's this little bucket seat on the side. Guy grabs them. So the question was, do we throw them, open up this front door, and throw them in front of the wheels? It's oh, wait a minute, guys. Whoa, whoa, whoa. let's slow down a little bit here. Mm -hmm. I said, let's take them with us. So he said, okay, well, no, there were no civilians allowed on the thing, mm -hmm. except the ones that worked there. So we're going along, and we get up outside the camp, and you got to have a pass to get in. I said, let's take them on the post. He says, an MPs will pick them up for sure. Yeah. Well, he says, how are we going to get him on? He says, stick a cap on him. So we stuck a cap on him, and we went down to the side entrance, and a couple of us guys saw it were gone. We got him in there, turned him loose. Next morning, we see him all chained up, hands and feet. Oh, wow. Him. Got him. Wow. But, yeah. Um, you know what? I'm going to ask a few just random things I, I, I thought about. Uh, what did glider troops think about airborne troops? What did they do? Yeah, what did what did you what did glider troops think about airborne troops and vice versa? Well, the gliders took the men into combat. But what did so? Um, they had twelve guys on it. But was there was there any kind of like back and forth on who was better in terms of a glider troop versus a paratrooper? No. They didn't want to be glidermen, and they didn't have room for us at first. But then the gliders came in later. Okay. But we had the same boots, everything they had. Right. Same privileges. Okay. Do you recall any uh, instances with enemy aircraft? In America. Enemy aircraft. Only, only once. They didn't have much when we got there. What was the, what was happening? You just saw so a it? jet came down and just blew them up. Did it shoot or just fly or? Well, it shot. That's later on, it was like, just went by. Mm -hmm. They didn't have much left when I got there. Yeah. They had ammunition and they had guns, but their air force was practically gone. Now, they wouldn't use it for that. They used it to protect Germany. Right. We went by the town of uh, Dusseldorf. Mm-hmm. <coughs> And that was the uh, Ruhr pocket mm -hmm. where they made all this stuff and yep. everything. Mm -hmm. Boy, they, they were trying to get through there. Mm. But that's where they had most of their weapons and stuff. Right. They didn't have a lot out in small areas or anything. They're trying to get that going. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the plane that you said shot, was it shooting at, at y'all or was it somewhere no, it else? Just, had an area. Gotcha. Didn't have anything Pacific. Yeah. Did it seem, you said it was a jet, did it seem a lot faster than oh, other planes? I don't planes? know if it was a jet or not. It was coming fast. Right. For us. And it was just one plane? One plane. Okay. Um, now you said you were in France, but you weren't in the, in the, I guess you weren't really in the combat zone of Normandy, but was, was there any hedgerows where you were at? Oh yeah. A 5 deuce was in there, 502, mm -hmm. and they had a bayonet charge in there. It was the only bayonet charge in the war. Mm -hmm. Five hundred second parachute infantry regiment. Do you did were you ever in the hedgerows? No, uh, no. Okay. Went by there, right? I'm sure, but never in it. Did uh did you ever encounter the Fallschirmjägers? A what? Fallschirmjägers, the the airborne troops for the Germans. No. No. What about SS? By what? SS? Oh yeah, we captured some SS, yeah. How many? I don't know. It was just different groups that picked them up because they were all back to mm -hmm. Germany. Hitler's house, that second floor, that was all SS troopers. Mm -hmm. The house wasn't there when you were there, was it? No. But that second floor, that was, that's what their job was. Yeah. To protect Hitler mostly. Right. And he wasn't popular with everybody. Mm -hmm. Do you recall anything about the SS? No. They weren't very nice. They weren't? From what the people told us. Oh, no. Mm. Wow. The Germans, some of the German people, some of the stories we got, like if you had, they came in and you had a gun in your house, they'd shoot you. Really? Wow. 
Um, did you ever encounter enemy tanks? Tanks? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I gotta go to the party. Sure. <laughs> Not enough. Right. <laughs> so we were um, discussing enemy tanks. I recall the story you said you shot at the, the truck behind the tank and then the tank took off. Is there any other stories with tanks that and you recall? The shell was already off in yep. the truck. Ammunition truck. Well. Mm -hmm. Did you ever see a tiger tank? Happy Fourth of July. Right. <laughs> He asked, did you, see a, did you ever see a tiger tank? No. No? If I did, I didn't know it. Right. They didn't, we didn't, we didn't know that. Fast. Some of the guys <laughs> did. There wasn't a lot around when I got there. Yeah. Did you have any other experiences with enemy tanks besides the one story? No. No? What well, about? We saw some, but shot at them and couldn't get them. Right. There weren't too many of them left. Uh-huh. Um, let's see here. I was hoping you could, I saw down there. Can you tell me, um, about your medals or your ribbons or citations, anything, uh, that you have? Oh, this actually talks about the fire oh, we were just talking about. Pardon me? This actually talks about the fire we were yeah. just talking about. Yeah. All right. So we're pleased to verify entitlement to the following awards. Bronze Star, Good Conduct Medal, European African Middle Eastern Campaign Medal with two Bronze Service Stars, World War II Victory Medal, Army Occupation Medal with Germany Clasp, Combat Infantry Men Badge, First Award, Honorable Service Lapel Button, World War II. Um... Your awards case number is A5KTF5332S8DD. Um, can you tell me about your, let's start with your Bronze Star Medal. What did you? Well, I'm not sure, but I think I got it. Uh, that time I uh, was gone where I pulled the cover off the Jeep and saved the Jeep and the people. And then somebody found it. My records probably uh, umpteen years later and I got it. Wow. So you actually didn't receive it while you were over there or from, oh. wow. This is what I, they were in metal happy back then. <laughs> Watch this. Oh, this is the box that they gave me. Well, this has stuff. I don't know. Where's this the bronze star? The Where's the bronze star? Uh, you have to open the boxes. I think they're in the boxes, Dad. Where's the box? Right here. Those on the no, this sofa. is not the bronze stone. No, the sofa no, right there. No, but I'm there, showing you the ones that you have. Oh, here's the medals. Okay. You want to see these? That's oh. just a repeated. Yeah, idea. no, no. I was just looking to see the ribbons and everything. What's what's this one? Do you recall? No. I gotta look that one up. I actually have a question. I, I notice on a lot of these old ribbons, they're wrapped like this. Did you, did this happen? Did y'all get this done in Germany or England or do you recall? Or did they sell them like this? I never this? had anything done in no? the States. My bronze saw metal from here. I don't know. Is it more? No, just a second. It's in a special box. Right? It's in a special box? Yeah, it's in the box. Black box about that big. Okay. okay. We have other things. Where would we? Other stuff of dad's. It's got to be there. Security boxes. Well, it doesn't matter anymore. So these are. You might have picked those up over the years. These are actually air assault wings. No, that's mine. Oh, that's the air assault. Yeah, that's the air assault. Well, I'll, I'll tell you about <laughs> this. Because I, I, I have I have airborne and aerosol wings. I actually got aerosol wings before I got the airborne when wings. When I was down in uh, at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, uh -huh. and they had the parade, and I was out there yelling for my 327 regiment when they came by. So the, my wife said, you're so loud, they're going to get you. I said, I can't do anything to me. 
Well, sure enough, here comes these big six foot two MPs. Mm. They said, would you come with us? Yeah, I'm going to come with you. Go out there, the colonel greeted me. He said, anybody that proud of the regiment? So they issued these, he gave me these. Huh, wow. And I don't know when, when, my, when, when was that? Where's my original, oh, where's my original wings? Uh, I don't know. This is what I had in the bag. Well, okay, I don't need them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's all that was in there. Okay, I don't have my original glider rings. Probably find them somewhere. There. <laughs> I, I, I earned them. Yeah. I promise you. Got no, no, I believe you. <laughs> I don't know what happened to them. <laughs> Where did you do... Um, so did you actually went to jump school or no? No, I never went to jump school. Okay. I went to glider school. Gotcha. So uh, were the glider wings different than the ac than the parachute? Yeah. Okay. They got a parachute on. Yeah, those. yeah. The different top on. Them. Okay. Can you see it in the picture? Here it is, baby. Found it. Uh oh. Oh, there it is. Cool. No, you can't see them. Yeah, you can. There it is, Dad. Oh, there it is. Yeah. There it is. He took it off. Do you know, if, is your name on the back of it? Yeah. Yeah, cool. Yeah. So what, what year did you get this? Was it? 20 years ago. Okay. I'm just guessing. That's wild. You never knew. <laughs> and they didn't have an actual citation for why you got it? Didn't back down. Wow. Hmm. But they just they mailed it to me. Wow. So I called them and they said, yeah. We well, saw that report there you had. Yeah, I saw it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I can get that later. Um, towards the end of the war, what was your thoughts when you heard about President Roosevelt? Roosevelt had died. Yeah. Oh, I felt sorry for him. Yeah. I thought he was a good president. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> when I was when I was probably sixteen or whatever he was, he got I thought he did some really good things. Mm -hmm. He balanced the budget. Did uh how did everybody else feel on that day? Did it just kind uh, of news and just like today. Yeah. Have party differences and right. I want this and he wants that and Right. Why didn't you do this when you could have did that? Right. Just like where you work. Mm -hmm. I understand. Um, let's see. <coughs> so you came home and you said you were on the Queen Elizabeth or what was the Queen Mary? Queen Mary, excuse me. <coughs> and you get home. Uh, I'm assuming you came back to New York. Yeah. On the boat. And were people waiting for you at the harbor? Oh, yeah. Were they like, were... the, like they didn't let it in. I had an experience there. Yes, I never had a good... <clears throat> this guy, John Groves, he had the American flag in his hand. Mm -hmm. the, the regimental flag from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And he's standing there, and his wife got on, the sh got it through... I got down there, he hands me the flag, and I pulled right in my face. <laughs> oh, think about it. now it makes me want to cry. Oh. Right across my face. Wow. And you can back it. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. Yeah. Mm. Howard, yeah. was was uh when you got off the ship, was the fam was your family there to greet you? No. What happened when you got off? <clears throat> well my brother he wouldn't he was he was four years old. If all the guys his age, and this is just not me, this was the group, they were all different. And we all felt that if they were born to fight World War II, mm -hmm. all of them, mm -hmm. they all had the different attitudes to us and everything. No, my mom, when I made the victory parade, my, my mother was in the stands. My sister and my brother in law, he was working and she already had kids, so she couldn't come down. Hmm. <clears throat> so, um, I guess when you got off the ship, 
uh, were you released? Or did you get uh, leave at that point? Oh or? no, we no. went right to camp. I think it was Camp Upton. Camp Upton, or, yeah. Fort Dix, right at Fort Dix. How long until you got to go back and see your family? Uh, we got passes. So I got a pass to go home. But when I got my pass, all the guys wanted to go with me. Mm -hmm. So I told them, New York, all the avenues go this way, streets, places, all go this way, from the Hudson River to the East River. And then they went with me, and I took them to the places along 8th Avenue, that had a 10 cents a dance place. Mm -hmm. You ever hear them? Mm -mm. You go in there and they have these girls and you dance with them, you buy a ticket, you 10 cents and you dance with them. Mm -hmm. So I took them in there. The next night, nobody but airborne soldiers could go into the 10 cents of dance place. Wow. And one of the guys met a girl <coughs> and they got married later on down oh, wow. in Fort North Carolina. Wow. Yeah. So when you, when you got back, when you were on pass and you finally got to go back and see your family did oh, you yeah. did you meet them somewhere or did you meet them at their house did no, you I went back to the, I had all day I left early did you surprise them at home oh yeah how was that very good very fun is your mom happy oh yeah she was <laughs> over to and was uh, <laughs> your siblings were there as well I didn't have any of them oh, okay it was just me gotcha where was your brother uh I have no idea like I said, uh, did, he, Harry, did Harry leave? He was different, last. Did, did Harry leave the service or did he stay in the service after you uh, finished? Oh, they had the 5220 Club. Did you ever hear about that? Uh-uh. Oh. They had the 5220 Club. Mm -hmm. You get $20 a week for 52 weeks. I got one week because I had a job. Mm -hmm. Wow. Were you able to readjust to civilian life? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Felt good to be home? Yeah. Very good. Yeah. I had a pretty good life. I know we didn't eat every day and never had money when I was a kid. But, yeah, I had a pretty good life. We did a lot of stuff. We played stickball, softball, mm -hmm. pitched horseshoes. Yeah. Did all kinds of things. Now, did you keep in touch with any of the your fellow veterans? I did for a while, after? but then it stopped. Yeah. Were they people from New York? Oh, no. Or elsewhere? No. <clears throat> One guy from New York. Okay. Forget his name and everything. <clears throat> and then once you separated, once you left the military, what was your next, what were your next steps? I went to SO. And that was, job it, was that here in Texas? No, in New York. Okay. Then, uh, as the years went along, they uh, they they become humble, okay. humble oil, mm -hmm. and we all came from New York down here. Okay. There's no more uh, there's no more Exxon or anybody. Well, a couple of board of directors made it in New York. Right. They're all down here. Wow. Came here in '61. Okay. Retired in '83. <laughs> um. So, how have wartime experiences affected your life? Wartime experience? Mm -hmm. Not, not really bad. No. Once in a while, I get something like that. And remember that I don't want to. But a lot of times, a lot of things, all of life experiences, like with Johnny Biro, and they, they, they adopted me mm -hmm. when I got there. I didn't know shit from Shinola. Excuse right. my French. <laughs> I think that's German, not French. <laughs> <laughs> what uh what were some life lessons you learned in the military that you that you take with you today respect it can be done it will be done mm -hmm. there's no question about it hmm. good lessons i told a bunch of kids one day they were going in the military and they said well uh suppose we don't want to do something I said, there's no supposed to do anything. I said, you do it. Mm -hmm. I said, well, what happens if you don't want to do it? I said, you don't want to be alive. Mm. Well, what could they make you do? I said, well, how many thousands of things do you want them to think up? 
make it do extra KP, go out duty, or whatever they want. Dig a ditch, yeah. fill it in, go back and keep emptying it out as long as they want you to. Right. They can't get away with that. The officers won't let you. Officers don't interfere. At least you didn't when we were there. Right. Unless mm -hmm. we needed you, then you come back. Mm -hmm. Wow. What was the worst day in your life? <coughs> worst day in my life? Mm -hmm. God, I can't. Can't remember. Can't remember. What about the best day? Best days when I came back from the war and started going out with my wife again. Yeah, it's a good day. <laughs> and then we got married. Married for 71 and a half years. Had wonderful family. Well, at least my daughter's father. <laughs> my boys were little white boys. Are. Yeah. Um, let's see. While I have you on recording, do you have any messages or life advice that you would give uh, to future generations who could hear this interview? Well, they need to learn one word, two words, I can. You don't give up, you can keep going. Learn respect and do what you're told to do. Go to school, work hard. All right, good advice. That's my advice to the young people. Is there anything else people should know about you? No. No? <clears throat> I've lived a pretty honorable life. I was uh, born and raised Episcopalian. When I came home from the war, my wife and I, had, we didn't even know it at the time. We were both Episcopalians. I was a senior warden, junior warden. I served on a vestry, an advisory group for the church. I ushered, I did everything you could do. Wow. Loved it. Yeah. <laughs> um, is there anything you feel that we haven't discussed that? Oh no. We got it all. All right. Um, there, I think you were telling me over the phone, but something about you had, did you bring back some uh, war trophies, and then they got confiscated when you got back into America? Oh, yeah, a lot of stuff. I think that's my last question. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't remember. I had a German P-38, mm -hmm. and uh, I got it home. I, I've had a permit to bring it home, mm -hmm. believe it or not. I bring it back one more time. And in New York City, they had so much trouble with the veterans, with the guns, they poured lead down the barrel. Mm. Just in New York City? I know they did it to us. <clears throat> so did did they actually take the pistol or they just poured something down? Poured the car, poured the lead down. And uh, they took mine, I don't know. They took some of them and did different things. Yeah. But they poured the lead down all of them. Where did you get that pistol from? I have no idea. Took it out of some house or something. Mm. We went through houses. All right. Did you, did you search the houses? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Where are you look? Oh. <laughs> what are you looking for? Germans, Nazi soldiers. Yeah. Didn't want them to leave the back of you. Right. You know that. Huh? Yeah. Well, that's what you spent a lot of your time just after the war. I mean, you got there like close to the end of the war. And so it ended and you spent a lot of time, I guess, trying to track down officers and things like that. that mm -hmm. You know, for the war crimes effort, I guess. Right. Yeah. Well, we were looking for the Nazi officers that got away, and mostly the SS troopers. Mm -hmm. They were the bad guys. Yeah. Did, did if you have a gun and you were German? Go to us, they'd shoot you. Do you have any uh, any stories about finding any of those guys? I mean, you mentioned one of them, but was there any other stories you? Yeah. No. No. <clears throat> And we, when we went into the houses, they, uh, they had a meeting before. They told us, don't flush the party. Don't sit on the party, don't flush it. Do not touch any pictures of Hitler or anything. So you had one guy, he would never listen. He goes in 
and he straightens the picture up and they had everything was mine. Right. Wow. Oh my God. They were geniuses at that. Was that in Berkshire's Garden? No, this was all, I don't know where it was. Oh, other places? I was on the way up there yeah. from Alsace-Lorraine. Alsace-Lorraine was French and German. Mm -hmm. You know that. Yeah, just kind of disputed territory. Fies. Yeah. But it was all part of... France. France. Mm -hmm. The German part was all considered part of France. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Certain things that there weren't a lot of lugas mm -hmm. were worth a lot of money. Mm -hmm. yeah. We didn't we didn't get money, and if we did, the officers got them. Right. Yeah, I turned them in, and they disappeared. I never had one to do. I just had that P thirty eight. I don't even know where I got it. And I know I came home with it. I had a letter one time authorizing me to have it. Yeah. So somebody took it though once you got to New York? No, they the city. They just confiscated it. Oh they they oh they had it in the newspaper every place. They, they you weren't allowed to have a gun. Oh. You could call it with a gun when I was a kid in New York, twenty years. Wow. I didn't know the gun laws went back that far. Oh there. god, yes. Because I know they're really strict now, but I didn't know they were that strict back then too. We had a guy in the neighborhood, Nunu Flynn. He was part of the mafia. Mm. And he had a gun, and we had to bury it for him wow. and keep your mouth shut. <laughs> you know Part the <laughs> New York Mafia, right? What about it? The Mafia in mm -hmm. New York. There's a place Mommy and I used to eat in called Bruno's. So we went down there on Friday nights, and Papa John would say, don't get it, they said, a damn a cook, a cat, a drunk. He says, get a meatball, spaghetti, and have a free martini. Free martini, God. So his son, John, worked in there. No, not his, the owner's son and his wife, and we got friendly with them. So one night we went out with them, and they told us to meet in this place called Mucho's. So we go over there, and we go in, not a spot at the bar. So we didn't have to go in, so I break my way in, and I go, Boy, I says, uh, bartender says, oh, you could see the guns. The police don't go in. So he says, what, can I help you? So I says, yeah, I'm John Bruno's son. So I'm looking for him here. The bar opens up. Wow. We go up to the bar. Yeah. We're practically the only ones at the bar. We go in the back and they got this nightclub. Oh, my God. We went back there with them, had a great time. Well, we... We didn't get the. We stayed there later than we should. Mm -hmm. It's two o'clock in the morning. So we're walking home because we couldn't get a cab, no car. And all of a sudden, Joyce says, "Hey, Russ," he says, "There's somebody following us." I said, "Yeah, I saw it." So I said, "The best thing you can do is jump in this storefront here, and I'll defend you the best I can." So the guy comes, "Oh, Mr. And Mrs. Barry," he says, "Don't get scared at all. There's four of us. We're just walking you home." Make sure nothing happens to you. John Bruno's son said, Don't if anything happens to you, we're dead. Wow. So Jeez. he walked us right up to our apartment, made sure we were in everything. About three months later, they sold everything. So the mafia. Who was John Bruno? He was one of the, he was the, the father on the bar. He was one of the mafia boys. Do you know what family he was a part of? No. No? Bronx family. No. Okay. Wow. And my, uh, my wife's Aunt Ruth, she went with this guy Emsweiler, <clears throat> and he was, they were out on a date, we, we, we met him once or twice, and he couldn't, they couldn't get a car to pick him up, he goes down and he goes home on the subway. So these guys catching him, a diamond ring, back then worth about $10,000, they couldn't get it off, they were going to cut off his finger. So finally, I guess he spit on it, and you've heard that. And he got it off. So about three weeks later, he comes back and we see him. He's wearing a wing. Mm. There's the Harlem River. There were four bodies in the Harlem River. Wow. That's wild. Yeah, they had a lot of mafia up in the Bronx. Did you typically know who they were? Some of them, yeah. Or did they blend in? We did not know them. No, we didn't. Yeah. We didn't I, know them. I always heard stories uh, from... You know, probably more so like the 20s or 30s, but they, 
they would always say back then the mafia guys were always very easy to notice who they were because they would always wear suits that were sure. far less plain than most people wore. Sure. They're very flashy. Sure. But then you fast forward later on, the mafia would just try to blend in completely. Oh, well, they'd live, in a, they'd live in like the place the Noonan Towers was a very nice apartment house. You couldn't afford to live in there. And I said, they'd go and live in a place like that. Mm. Oh. But when that night we walked home, we were safe as could be. The four guys. Four guys, two right in back of us and two across the street.